gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution is not going to get that man today. No, because I'm going to get him. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, listeners from coast to coast, worldwide on the Internet. This is the special weekend edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report. Today is June 28, 2014. It's a Saturday, a very special edition. We are. Uh, this is actually the first, the debut of the weekend edition with the weekend vigilante. Oh, how appropriate. Sheila Zielinski, a very tenacious researcher. Uh, talk show host, obviously, and uh, an all-around truth seeker, great woman, and uh, she. We, we are teaming up. The Hagman and Hagman Report is just teaming up with the Weekend Vigilante Show to create the Weekend Edition. This is tonight's show, and every successive Saturday show, Weekend Edition, is actually as much uh, Sheila Zelensky's as it is ours. In fact, it's even more. She was the impetus for this, and. Uh, we were searching for uh, the ability to provide you with information uh, with a reliable, tenacious, trustworthy host for the weekend edition. And it's Sheila Zelensky, the weekend vigilante. I've met her in person. Joe and I have met her in person, talked with her extensively. And I've got to tell you, um, she is a wonderful, gracious uh, woman with a lot of character and integrity. Now, now that I've laid the groundwork there, I want to just tell you that we broadcast uh, normally live each and every weeknight from 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time, but this will be a weekend staple. Sheila Zelensky, the weekend vigilante, teaming up with the Hagman and Hagman Report. Her website, theweekendvigilante.com. Uh, uh, um, folks, go to homelandsecurityus.com and click on the link to her website. Also tonight, the guest for tonight, the second hour, is in fact, uh, I'm sorry, it's not The Weekend Vigilante. Thank you, Joe, for pointing that out. It's weekendvigilante.com. The guest second hour is going to be Dave Hodges. Joe's in studio uh, tonight as well for this premiere broadcast. Um, yes, I am, and uh, I spent the day at the beach and had to come back for this, and I'll tell you that if I'm leaving the beach for any reason, uh, this would be the, the choice I'd make. This is uh, looking forward to this. Uh, weekend show and, and kicking it off tonight. We got a lot of information we're going to get into, and I want to um, give it over to Sheila, and uh, we'll get into um, kind of how we got and decided we're, what we're doing and why we're doing it. Yeah, well, some of the goals, and ho- first of all, hello, Doug and Joe, and it's really nice to kind of combine forces and and uh, with a goal of really providing information to people. And, you know, especially as we wind up each week, it's really nice to kind of go into the weekend and kind of provide an overview of what's going on. And, some, I mean, you can't make this stuff up anymore, am I right? No, you, you, absolutely not. Um, the, you know what, Sheila, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speechless, really, which, which is probably a bad thing for a talk show host to be. When you look at the headlines, the whack-a-mole in Washington, um, and uh, all, all the headlines around the world, you're playing whack-a-mole. I, I'm just speechless at, at how quickly we have devolved as a society. Well, this, as a and, and it's really beginning to reach Caligula levels here because no one has ever put up with a, a government running this level of roughshod over its citizenry. There's, just, it, there's never been a time in history, I don't think, really. I mean, I was just perusing through the... The headlines, and I thought, this is unbelievable when you look at what's going on. You've got this, you know, you've got Syria, you've got Mexican military firing on U.S. border agents, you've got the militarized police now treating citizens as wartime enemies. And then Colorado now, the, the judge there, remember he said, oh, the U.S. US Constitution, nothing to do with gun control. I mean, it's, it, you cannot even make sense of craziness. You know, I'm glad you brought that 
that uh, the federal or the uh, courtroom in color, court in Colorado or these judges in Colorado, what we're seeing here is really, I believe, with respect to the judiciary here in the United States, a corrupt judiciary where you cannot go anywhere now to get justice. There is no justice through the court system any longer. So people, and that goes for Congress as well. So for, for people who are looking for justice in the normal venues, you're not going to find it. Well, and just so people know, Doug, on Thursday, a federal judge upheld Colorado's new gun control laws that mandate background checks for all gun sales and limit magazine capacity to 15 rounds. So this U.S. District Chief Judge Marcia Krieger, she issues this 50-page ruling, and it is unbelievable what is happening. You know, in her ruling, essentially, she's made it clear that she wasn't going to rule on whether you know, the, the new laws made sense or even had anything to do with the Constitution. So essentially... What's happening is a lot of judges are just saying, you know, we're not going to deal with the Constitution in my court. Well, I got a newsflash for all these judges. The Constitution is the highest law in the land, and laws are subject to the Constitution. Like, I'm not sure, <laughs> I don't even know where to start with this. I mean, all these people should be hung for treason. And I'm very serious when I say that statement. Oh, I, no, I, I totally agree, and I know Joe and I have talked about it privately and personally. Uh, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of, um, on my end, a lot of law enforcement people here locally who are starting to wake up and realize that, that wait a minute, there's something is terribly wrong with the orders they're receiving, that the, with, the, um, uh, with what they're seeing develop within the law enforcement community. So having said all of that, um, I don't think that there's enough. Seriously, uh, I, I don't think if we had trials for treason, and for sedition, as we should have, and uh, implement the justice that, that that was back in the late 1700s, early 1800s. I don't think there's enough uh, oak trees and and lamp posts and uh, rope to go around. Uh, seriously, uh, and I'm not saying that as, as a threat. I'm just saying that as an observation. Well, and I think the other big issue here is there's. I mean, look at since 2000, Doug. All employment growth has went to immigrations. So anybody that's essentially immigrating into the U.S., that is where they've targeted all the employment growth. So, you know, you've got one in five Americans, you know, on unemployment or some kind of disability. I mean, look at the situation. I mean, obviously, we're not going to rehash what V and W and others have talked about in the implosion of the economy. But, I mean, we're talking about probably in July having a systematic meltdown. And then you've got the Border Patrol situation. I mean, there's cartels using de facto amnesty to smuggle whatever they want into the U.S., concurrent to these Mexican military now firing on U.S. border agents. I mean, this all is right out of a sci-fi, and I don't know what Obama is doing. In fact, has he even made any kind of address about the situation, really? That's a great question. I haven't seen it, Sheila. I haven't seen any reference to this from Obama or even the executive uh, branch. Now, it's very possible that during the uh, day-to-day, that earlier today he might have made a, a, a obligatory kind of comment, but I don't think I don't think there's anything of substance. But Let's, Sheila, yeah, he, he did not get okay. into this. Um, you, you on the White, WhiteHouse.com, you can go through statement releases, press briefings, etc. Right. I think climate change focus on economic priorities, and um, you know. Agenda 21 stuff is, is what's the main focus here. I don't see anything about this uh, breach of national security. No, yeah, but, but but Sheila, one thing, if I can, if I can ask you about this, and I want to just touch base with you on this. One thing I've been researching pretty heavily here is the fact that uh, uh, our economy. Uh, you had mentioned about the uh, V and Steve and, and the you know the information which was imported by them. What I've been hearing here is, and, and I did not know this. You're in the Vancouver, British Columbia area um, uh, at the moment, uh, physically. And, and yes. the Chinese own a great, really, the majority of British Columbia. Well, we, actually call it, we actually call it Hongcouver, and that's not a joke. And wow. actually, there's so many Chinese now that are in Richmond, B.C. In fact, we have a nice little... Um, they actually dedicated a beautiful little statue of Mao Zedong. Right, uh, they built it right in the middle of Richmond, which is uh, is not just wonderful. Uh, yeah, but it's it's unbelievable how many have migrated into that area. In fact, if you actually drive into Vancouver, the chances of you seeing 
just a Caucasian person, which I'm, I'm always fascinated by that word. They merged the word Asian in there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, you, you cannot see a, a light skinned person in the whole area, whether they're, you know, there's Philippines, Koreans, Japanese, Chinese. It's hard to find just a normal looking Caucasian individual in all of Vancouver. And that is not straying from the truth, Doug. And Sheila, I'd say uh, in my experience, you know, from being in eastern parts of Canada, Toronto, Niagara Falls, uh, it's the same way over there. Yeah, and yes, one yes, thing, yes. I got to tell you, Sheila, one thing that just blew my mind is to find out, and Jim Willie from the Golden Jackass, I referenced off air to you, um, mentioned this, and, and I had done some research and found this to be true. Uh, communist China owns 30% of Manhattan commercial property. Now, now think about that. 30%, a third of Manhattan's commercial property, roughly, is owned by the Communist Chinese, including the uh, J.P. Morgan Chase building, which they they got at, uh, at fire sale prices. But here's what really blew my mind. The Federal Reserve in Dallas 55 Pearl Street, I believe it is, or, or on Pearl Street in Dallas, flew, was flying, equal with the United States flag, the Chinese flag. Mm-hmm. Did, you, did you hear about that? Yes. Yes, I did. Well, you know, China owns everything. I mean, really, when you think about, I think I've talked about this with uh, Jim Garrow on my show. Think about this, Doug and Joe. You know, we talk about China. Remember, of course, the big showdown at the Bundy Ranch. Well, we were talking about China building these special economic zones. There's five of them in America, and they're, so they're collecting their debt, essentially. And essentially, these agreements say if the U.S. defaults, China can go in, boots on the ground, and claim the natural resources. So they've already got them in South America and Africa. So certain economic zones of of uh, the United States are being run by Russia and China. So China's building these special economic zones. Okay, we get it. Uh, you know, we know there's quite a few of them. I think there is five. But it's, this is the part that really staggers me, is China's law takes effect in the middle of America. That's essentially what you're hap- what's happening. It's not American law in these agreements, Doug and Joe. It's Chinese law. So they essentially say, like I just said, China's got full authority to go in boots on the ground and claim the natural resources. So if China owns our our debt, they already own our ports and our resources. So and if they own the debt, they own the Fed. And if the Fed lends money to your bank, they lend it to you. So not only does China own your home, but they own everything else. They own everything you own, your mortgages, your four hundred one Ks, your pension, our energy, our ports. You know, they could essentially force starvation, compliance. You know, we're talking about complete subjugation because How many quarter, is it a quarter million? Or I don't know how many Chinese troops are already on our soils. So this is a very alarming, frightening scenario. Would you agree? Absolutely. Uh, Yes, I would. And, you know, we had um, a guest that you've had on, uh, Danny Moreno, who went, moved to Germany and was shown some revelation given by God. He wrote some books on what he was shown. And he said that we will be slaves in our own country if we're lucky when this is all said and done. Well, I think they'll soon be exerting complete dictatorial control over the U.S. Because, I mean, we've kind of arrived at, I think we can all safely say that we're kind of at this final turning point for America and human history. And, I mean, if we're seeing a convergence and acceleration of forces that I think it's unprecedented, Doug and Joe, in the history of civilization. You know, the geopolitical, the economic, the technical, the cultural, the moral, the spiritual. I mean, every... You know, I mean, this sounds cliche, but we are getting pummeled six ways to Sunday here. You know, we can't even take a deep breath here. Every time we turn around, we're confronted by something else. We're just consistently being bombarded, you know, especially even by the media stuff. I mean, look at all these crazy spin-doctored stories on the media right now. You know, the and, and again, what's it all about? Well, the behind the plan is the motto out of, uh, order out of chaos, so new world order out of chaos. I mean, that's really the playbook here, isn't it? Well, it is, and you know, it's not like no one told us. This is the thing that really, you know, I, Sheila, I got to tell you, up until 2004, maybe 2005, I was walking around uh, a zombie like everyone else, uh, a, a kind of a happy zombie in a way, or not a happy, but somewhat content, thinking, okay. 
Uh, things are relatively normal. You know, absolutely, uh, 9-11 happened because of 19 crazed hijackers out of, uh, uh, you know, without any help from the Western intelligence world. Um, everything is, as I've been told, I watched, you know, cheered Fox News and the, I followed the conservative commentators. I mean, I was just a neocon, probably, uh, if, 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 probably a, a textbook definition of a neocon. And then I started to, uh, really understanding what, what's really going on. And, and I know that a lot of people are saying, well, you know, you're an idiot. And, and yeah, I, I got to tell you, um, probably by definition I was. And some may say I still am. But the fact of the matter is um, we're being manipulated because one of the things that I found, and I, I know that you know about this, I mean, Brzezinski, Zygmunt Brzezinski, back in 1970, <laughs> is, he's written uh, the, uh, uh, the white papers about the technocrat, uh, technotronic era. And about yeah, I mean he he lays out the new world order plan. I mean, so had we paid attention, or had I paid attention earlier on, I, f- I feel like I feel like yeah. I failed. It, it's know? not even a matter of um, having to find secret classified information. These people outright say what they're going to do and release their plans. We even go back to Woodrow Wilson in his speech on October 13, 1917, talking about the uh, Federal Reserve System. He says. It is a manifestly imperative it is manifestly imperative that there should be a complete mobilization of banking reserves of the United States. The burden and privilege must be shared by every banking institution in the country. I believe that the cooperation on the part of the banks is a patriotic duty at this time, and that membership of the Federal Reserve System is a distinct and significant evidence of patriotism. Assurance has been added to our hope for the future peace of the world by the wonderful and heartening things that have been happening in the last few weeks in Russia. Here is a fit partner for a league of honor. And well, yeah, and look at old Brzezinski. What did he say? One of his beauty quotes was that Caesar to kill a million people, then control them. I mean, every one of these hedonistic hucksters from Kissinger to Rockefeller, they're always saying these insidious in nefarious quotes. I mean, very ominous things of depopulation. I mean, Prince Philip, he said if he ever was reincarnated, he'd like to come back as a deadly virus to wipe out the planet. Only, only somebody like that would get away with even a statement like that. I mean, it's absolutely mind-numbing that he could even make such a preposterous statement that he'd like to wipe out the planet. I mean, does that register as a red flag with anybody, do you think? And Sheila, I actually have the Brzezinski quote. I'm going to play it. It's about a minute. Uh, here we oh, go. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> that for the first time in human history, for the first time in all of human history, almost all of mankind is politically awake. And these new and old major powers face still yet another novel reality, in some respects unprecedented. And it is that while the lethality, the lethality of their power is greater than ever, their capacity to impose control over the politically awakened masses of the world is at a historical low. I once put it rather pungently, and I was flattered that the British Foreign Secretary repeated this as follows, namely in earlier times, It was easier to control a million people, literally. It was easier to control a million people than physically to kill a million people. Today, it is infinitely easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. Uh, You know, for an intelligent, well-spoken man... (laughs) He sure is an evil guy. And Sheila, I'm, I'll turn this back over to you, but I just want to say this. Th- if folks think about this. His daughter, Mika, is a co-host on, uh, what is it, The Morning Joe, Joe with Joe Scarborough. Right. Now, Joe, Joe Scarborough, don't forget, was a U.S. House member from uh, 95 to 01, a Republican, okay, in the 1st District of Florida. He was named in 2011 one of the most uh, influential people, one of the top uh, 100 influential uh, uh, people in the world. Uh, but think about this, and people keep forgetting about this. It was July 20th, 2001, 14 or 13 years ago, next month, that one of his aides was found dead in his in her office when she supposedly fainted alone in his Fort Walton Beach, Florida office. Think about that. You know, you got uh, 
Well, you got aides and interns dying under both Republican and Democratic organizations, uh, representatives, and um, uh, to, you know, for for those who think that uh, she just simply fainted and died after hitting her head on the corner of a desk, hey, stuff happens, right? I'm sorry, Sheila. Go ahead. Well, that's like that. As you were talking, it reminded me um, of when you and I were talking about the trail of dead banksters. And uh, who is the gal in the? Um, we had a same scenario playing out, like the gal that worked. Uh, remind me who again that was, Doug. Um, it, it, very same scenario. Oh, uh, in other words, she actually Chandra Levy. Right through, yeah, went through herself out of a window of a how many story building. I mean, same scenario playing out. The we never I'm did sorry, find but, out uh, what happened with these bankers, did we? That story sort sort of just got swept under the rug, didn't it? Crickets chirping yeah. in the news media about that one too, guys. Yeah, yeah. Although it's amazing the what you don't reporting. hear in the six o'clock news, isn't it, Doug and Joe? I mean, aside from the uh, future economic situation in the U.S., would people do people really care about bankers being knocked off? Well, I think it's it, it is in the larger picture. Sheila, right, with you know, the future of the U.S. Uh, being a, a economy, being a part of it, people do have an interest, but. Um, well, the fascinating part of that story that um, nobody was picking up, and I think you and I kind of broke that, Doug, was the fact that nobody was talking about one angle of it, and that was the fact that J.P. Morgan Chase Bank actually had suicide policy. They're the only bank that actually has uh, coverage for if their bankers commit suicide, and then they get a massive payout. I thought that was really interesting. You, you know, Sheila, you broke that story, and, and uh, I watched as detractors had spoken about key man insurance, which is uh, uh, basically a policy, a life insurance policy for key uh, individuals in a corporation. But when it extends to down to the level of an IT uh, worker or somebody outside of the board of directors or outside of the, uh, beyond that, that, that very uh, small nugget of individuals, then you, you really have to take a look at uh, at, at the reason for that. So, yes, you broke that story. And, and folks, just to reiterate that, what, what Sheila was in her research found that uh, J.P. Morgan Chase said the, you know, they were covering their employees, you know, in the event they commit suicide. And, and normally, there's a two-year suicide exclusionary clause that was being waived, intentionally waived uh, with these people. So read into that what you will. Uh, it's certainly not business as usual with the bankers. And that was... that. Believe me, I, I didn't have much to do with that story. That was all your all your story. Well, I'm anxious for Dave to come on too because uh, there's a couple of really interesting uh, pieces we're going to sort of tie together in some other very nefarious, ominous activity here. But I mean, actually, it's funny, you know, Doug, you have been very consistent with Dave Hodges stating that World War III would begin in Syria. I mean, you look at the rumblings in the Middle East right now, and you know, every day we're just hearing more and more about this militant Islamic group, ISIS, and other people are calling them um, Al-Sham. Like, it's very interesting that we're, we're really, the world is beginning to witness the unfolding of this prediction that we're going to look at a possible World War III scenario. You know, and historians may look back upon Israel's recent attacks upon nine military targets inside of Syria as the Archduke moment for World War III here, but it's a really interesting kind of convenient provocation, don't you think? Because you look at the IDF claims that they were part of a clear message being delivered to the Syrians in response to a series of cross-border shootings to protect the citizens of Israel. And I think there was as many as 10 Syrian soldiers that were killed, but on the surface, the attacks appear to be measured and completely justified. But when you really start to look at the, the tentacles of this thing, a very ominous picture starts to emerge, Doug and Joe, and it's it looks like the bulk of these attacks were directed against targets on Golan Heights. So, you know, the more you kind of peel away the onion, yeah, I mean, it's it, of course there was, you know, it's tragic the killing of the that Israel teen. But the more and more you look at this, it looks like it's ex Israel is exploiting the situation for military gain. And of course, I'm speaking directly about some of the military targets which were attacked by Israel. That has nothing to do with retaliating against Syria for the death of that boy. So it just, you know, it just, it's very interesting. And you know what I was um, talking to Joe about just before the show, a couple minutes before we got on, I thought it was a very interesting, in, I don't know if your audience is familiar with Albert Pike, 
the good old, uh, if, <laughs> for anybody that just Google Albert Pike, he was a very massive Freemason huckster. Um, but anyway, he talked about drawing the Muslim world being into a war with Israel. Like he was basically saying a long, long time ago that there would be a World War III scenario. So I find that really interesting because, you know, as you read things like 1984, Orwell's book, and I think that was written in, uh, I think, in the early 40s, and then Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, 1932. So you look at all these writings, and then you kind of springboard into where we're at. It's just very interesting that Albert Pike, this extremely, I mean, the guy was evil incarnate, but he was talking about the Zionist established versus Muslim, and this, you know, promoted the scenario that Pike talked about. So look at what's happening right now. You've got this extreme Muslim group, you know, the most cast, I think they're the most, maybe, you know, you can, somebody can correct me on this, but I think they're, they're said to be the most cash rich militant group in the world. They kind of come out of nowhere, you know, and they're doing what Albert Pike predicted was, he was talking about grotesque violence, the Sunni Muslims and the, you know, Iranian, Iraq, Shia Muslims wanting to essentially take over Iraq, Syria, and Israel. Now, the interesting thing is Americans and NATO are committed to protect Israel. So what happens when this whole thing plays out, I think we can see that, you know, they're, they're looking at a complete, absolute meltdown. And what do they want to do after all this happens? They want to rebuild. Their vision that has gone back a long time, an image of a world army, a world government, a world bank, world currency, this centralized control. And I think it's really easy, Doug and Joe, to see this whole scenario unfolding. Uh, Look, I I totally agree with you. And a couple of points, if I may, uh, to kind of uh, buttress what you said here. Number one, if, if folks, if you look at the world stage right now, a couple of things I believe our listeners have to really understand. First of all, uh, let's go. Let's go with start with uh, Russia, Ukraine, and kind of move east to ISIS and Syria and so on. Russia and Ukraine. Um, when Ukraine flared up, it was the Western intelligence world, the Langley operatives or the CIA operatives that really were were the impetus behind it, working for the IMF. Folks, in March of this year, or sometime around that period, uh, they stole uh, 33 tons of gold and $70 billion from the national banks out of Ukraine, and uh, that meaning the uh, the, uh, IMF as well as the uh, CIA operatives, if you will. Crimea, and and Jim Willie addresses. There's a delay, apparently, some audio issues. Uh, We have some audio issues. Sheila, can you hear us? I think I'm still on, guys. Okay. Did you hear a delay? I did. Okay. I think it's back to normal. No? Uh, No, it's not. uh, Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, that really knocked me off my thought process there. Okay, and nonetheless, ISIS is a CIA creation as well and funded. And Sheila, you mentioned something about being um, being one of the most um, uh, heavily funded groups. In fact, they are next to AQIM, Al Qaeda, and the Maghreb, which yes. by by numbers, AQIM is a much smaller organization where ISIS, and folks note the name ISIS, it's a much larger organization and much more uh, ruthless, whereas AQIM is involved in weapons smuggling and, and human trafficking and drug trafficking. ISIS is involved in just killing everyone um, that's uh, not conforming to their Wahhabi uh, type of uh, doctrine and establishing an Islamic caliphate throughout the Middle East. So that's all I wanted to say. Well, and you know what else is really quite alarming, too? You notice that Putin's aide said that the U.S. is preparing a war. Now, if they try to take Crimea back, I suspect Putin will react. You know, you're looking at a calculated war. Saudi Arabia and Qatar funding this attempt to trigger World War III scenario. I mean, Doug, this is a very cold, calculated, methodical progression, I believe. And it, it almost, you know, the rumblings in the Middle East, Libya, Syria, and ISIS, these are not random scenarios. They want to offer order out of the chaos, the new world order. This is the bigger playbook in all this, I believe. Exactly. 
And you know, you know what I found interesting? A uh, recent Drudge headline. I, I I think this is right around the time ISIS had taken retaken Iraq, marching toward Baghdad. And of course, Baghdad has not fallen yet, but it will uh, to ISIS. Um, w stays silent was the um, headline, and and obviously that was George W. Bush, a reference to him. Um, how much complicity, Sheila, do you think that the George W. Bush has played in this or has in this whole Oh, you mean agenda. Mr. Skull and Bones himself? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's... Uh, oh, man. <laughs> well, I yeah. mean, obviously, um, you know, <laughs> what's happening with these ter- terrorist organizations operating in the Middle East, Doug, and beyond, it's, you know, there's a strong economic capacity, like you just said, but that could be exploited to support and acquire influence over operations of other terrorist organizations, too. I mean, a lot of these, you know, it's really interesting because in addition, enormous quantities of high-quality weapons, many of them Western, have fallen into ISIS hands. How did that happen? You know, and they're certainly going to find their way to terrorist organizations operating in all these combat zones in the Middle East and beyond. That happens in many other areas of the world too so israel is watching the development of the battle in iraq with great interest so while it appears that this stage there's you know there's maybe no immediate threat to israel's security from the events in iraq but the resulting atmosphere atmosphere i think could potentially strengthen global jihadist elements by operating around the area so i mean and and one other interesting thing is in isaiah what does it talk about Damascus becoming a ruinous heap? Interesting. 2,000 years uh, ago, course. that was written. Yeah, and, and the, the Psalm 83, the Psalm 83 war, um, if you will, the confederation of ten nations coming upon Israel, uh, although in that scenario, I believe that Israel is dwelling in relative peace and safety within the neighborhood. So there's got to be something that does happen that, to me, that Israel somehow, in some way, through some global power reshifting, takes on more land or becomes safer, where the walls come down around the, the kibbutzes, kibbutzes or kibbutzes and stuff uh, in, in cities. Any, any well, and you got to wonder what you know. You got to wonder where Iran is in all this, and then of course, you know, presumably Turkey's not going to sit idly by either if you know they keep playing out these extreme scenarios. So. You know, there's a lot of dangers posed with this thing. And, and I mean, of course, you look at the positioning. I think Russia and China, though, are just kind of chess players in this whole scenario, which is kind of interesting because if you do read the book 1984 by George Orwell, and again, keep in mind this is written in, what, uh, 30s or 40s. It was talking about um, Oceania. Do you remember this book, the Oceania oh, yeah. versus uh, Euro-Asia? I thought that was a really interesting little scenario. <laughs> It's it's unbelievable how this stuff is all, you know, it's all unfolding like it's predicted. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? I yeah, it, it does. It, it's it, and there are people who still can't see the big picture here. That they they believe everything is kind of a, a result of a random mistakes, incompetence. I the next person who ascribes incompetence to what we're seeing here. Uh, you know, I I just want to smack upside the head, Sheila. I really do. This is not incompetence. This is by design. Absolutely. So what did you think of the Colorado gun control uh, bombshell that unfolded this week, Doug? We expect more. They expect more. And, and, and this is legislation from the judicial side of things, which is never – you've got a, a really a uh, – a cabal of rogue federal courts, court systems, yeah. that are rewriting the Constitution or rewriting the laws, discarding the Constitution. This is a lawless bunch, renegade in chief. That's our, uh, Sheila, uh, during our, our weekly broadcast, Obama must be referred to uh, by callers as the renegade in chief. Uh, that's one of our rules now. Uh, because Renegade is his Secret Service not-so-secret code name, and Renegade is the lawless one, seditious, uh, traitorous by definition. So it fits him. Isn't that interesting how that happened uh, when he came aboard 
he was okay. He must have been okay with that name, Renegade, that Secret Service code name, Renegade. So um, not that, I, you know, I'm being kind of facetious here in a way, uh, but, but the fact of the matter is it's still applicable. So uh, anyway. Well, you better be careful what you say, Doug. You, you don't want to get SWAT teamed by some of the new um, executive orders now that anybody that's, you know, calling out Obama for any kind of activity, they're really starting to scrutinize that now, of course. And then Hillary, she wants to shut Doug and Doug and Sheila down to <laughs> any kind of alternative right. news media now. She's really pushing that one, too. So you have to kind of wonder uh, with the censorship that's uh, kind of looming on the on the horizon how much time we actually have to do shows like this, really. It's interesting because about 15 minutes before tonight's broadcast, I noticed uh, an increase in bandwidth and uh, in checking, we we are victims, or in, in fact, may still be victims of a direct or denial of service attack uh, to uh, cause audio problems. And, and people think that this is that, that you, you know we're a two-bit operation. Well, we're not. I mean, we we've, we we've invested thousands of dollars worth of equipment. We've uh, we've got computers, the, the state-of-the-art computers, lines going out of our studio. We've got a dedicated studio. So you're right. Sheila, I mean, what is taking place right now is the marginalization of truth seekers like Sheila Zelensky. And Sheila, you, of all people, and folks, I, I would urge you to support uh, Sheila Zelensky, the weekend vigilante. Um, it, this, the broadcast on Saturday night, really, this is her baby. Um, we're just kind of here. We're, we're merging forces, but, but really, this is her baby, and she works so hard to, to, to bring you the truth. So um, if you feel blessed by what you hear, certainly support Sheila Zelensky at WeekendVigilante.com. Uh, we're just kind of, uh, you know, we're just kind of mucking up the joint, right, uh, Sheila? Joe and I, that's all we are doing But uh, uh, by being here. Well, but it's funny, Doug, you say the word truth, and I think that there is not a lot of people that are really... Uh, you know, getting into the layers of the onions. I mean, there's a, just a few. There's people like Dave Hodges from the Common Sense Show. There's Hagman's, of course, and myself. But, I mean, look at the bought and paid for lamestream media hucksters here. They're always spin-doctoring things. And, I mean, if you can show me one of these media people, I mean, people send me stuff all the time. I get inundated with emails, and people say, well, what about Sean Hannity? And what about, I mean, give me a break. Sean Hannity? I mean, are people, do you think people are that stupid that they actually think that Fox is really covering the news, Doug? You know what, Sheila, I was a big Sean Hannity fan uh, when it was Hannity and Combs. I was a big um, Bill O'Reilly fan. I was a big Rush Limbaugh fan. I mean, I, seriously, I, I, in 04, 03, 01, 02, you know, during that time period. And, uh, and, and then the scales kind of dropped off. And, and I realized when... Um, and Sheila, I'm not sure if you know this. I'm not even sure if the audience knows this in its entirety. But it was in the, um, I believe it was in the fall of 07 into the into the summer of 08. There was, I had a series of meetings with a, uh, oh, i got to be very careful how I say this, because uh, a series of meetings with someone who works at Fox News Rock, or in, in Manhattan, I'm sorry. Um, and she had access to many of the desks that you would think you wouldn't think necessarily would be open. Okay. And she told me that Fox news, uh, in particular or specifically had their own mini police force, if you will, of censorship were editors. No, no. I, yeah, well, you're right. Um, she was giving me information about the talking points given to the given to the um, um, people you see on camera, and should they stray from those talking points or develop a mind of their own, they would suffer severe consequences. You can compare it to the firm, the movie The Firm, and while we were meeting, I, I observed physically with my own two eyes surveillance, physical surveillance on this woman. And she said, look, they're watching me. You just get out of here. And uh, I will say this. She has subsequently moved with her son 
and they, they threatened her son, and who was an infant at the time. And uh, she has uh, moved out of the country. And she's doing fine, but she's not talking. And that's the level of censorship now we can expect here, I believe. Well, absolutely. And look at uh, some of these nightmare bills like SOPA, CISPA, and these other bills that essentially will lose Doug Hagman's website way down at the bottom of Never Never Land. Essentially, it eases out the ones that they don't like. And, uh, you know, you go to Google Hagman, well, it's nowhere to be found. These are the kind of things that are happening right now. And, of course, you know, um, oh, here's a story I'm sure you guys would love too. Did, Doug and Joe, did you hear that Google is starting to sell a humanoid robot which can walk, climb, use tools, and even drive a car now? Isn't that impressive? That, that's just what we need. <laughs> Not only that, but they want to, I mean, you look at the, the mechanisms of control uh, from putting black boxes in cars to tax people by the mile to uh, putting these you know cities up through agenda 21 that don't even ha- you, you won't even be allowed to own a car um and, and if you do the price for everything uh, will be so astronomically high that you wouldn't even want to um, well that's what agenda 21 is Sheila, you're an expert on this that's what agenda 21 is all about putting people in the cities taking away their their need to travel to use a car uh you know put them on trains it, it, it's it's insidious um Take them out of flyover country, push them into the cities, take away their transportation, make them dependent upon the public system, stress the public system, crash the public system. People, wake up. It's happening right before your very eyes. Well, yeah, what's really unbelievable about the Agenda 21 is they really want people, you know, stacked and packed in these little green cities. They don't want you having any transportation. They don't want you owning property. My God, owning property? That's, you know, that's ridiculous, <laughs> It's unbelievable that this thing, but the weird thing is, you know, and the best definition for people, a lot of people, you know, I, I keep thinking these, all these people that are so awake, but when I mention Agenda 21, when I go and speak or go have a talk about it, I mean, people go, well, okay, I've heard of Agenda 21, but I don't really know what it is. The best definition comes right from the UN itself. So in 1993, the UN published Agenda 21, the Earth Summit Strategy to Save our planet and so essentially what it is it's the 21st century agenda that proposes an array of actions which are intended to be implemented by every person on earth and i'm talking profound reorientation of every one of your children uh, because basically anybody probably 40 and up it's too late but i mean they can really indoctrinate our children and this is part of what common core does So essentially, you know, it calls for these very profound reorientation and specific changes in the activities of every human being. A profound reorientation. That's actually the wording right out of their their protocol. And it says, you know, I mean, I think essentially like people go, well, what's wrong with saving our planet? Because, see, it's always this very malevolent agenda disguised as a benevolent one. And that's the problem with this because words like, sustainable development and eco-friendly they sound great don't they doug and joe but when you really scratch the surface of it i mean it's it's unbelievable and this is a this says right in the wording of agenda 21's document and anybody can go on un and and uh, print out this document but they had an earth summit that was held in rio de janeiro in 1992 and it outlines in detail the un of course we all know that you know what hole should be shut down, but it's their vision for a centrally managed global society. And if fully implemented, it would have control, and I mean control over every aspect of every human on earth. So, I mean, what does it call for? Well, some of the things are it's dramatically increasing urbanization. It forces population out of rural areas and into these, like I said before, these densely populated stack and pack micro apartments controlled by the technocrats with the ability to control Everything, and I mean, I mean every aspect of people's life. So, what would that be look like, Doug and Joe? Hell on earth. That's what we're talking about. Yes, it is, and um, you know, we see the rise in um, violent crime to heinous acts that we never saw anything like before, with the recent cannibal attacks that we went through last year to yeah, what, uh, the knockout happened? teams to. Whatever happened to the zombie uh, attacks? Stop smoking bath salts, maybe. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, uh, honestly. 
But it is Well, and you guys it, have heard of that zombie virus now, haven't you? No. No, I might have it. What are the symptoms? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I we I haven't, Joe. Um I can't say that I have. Well, then we'll have to just drop a little nugget today, and Deborah Traveris can get into that next Saturday because she's, uh, the, the, she's our guest on the show. And I'll tell you what, she is going to get into some stuff that's going to make your hair curl, people. You think you've heard it? You think you've heard it all now? Just wait till next Saturday, so you have to bookmark that show. Essentially, they're developing different kind of crimeria. I mean, I think that uh, Tom Horn's book. I was just actually reading in Tom Horn's amazing book, and if it's I don't know if it's available to the public yet, but I can't encourage people enough to get blood on the altar, the coming war between Christian and Christian. But um, in the book, it was talking about genetics playing a role in the global Lucifer effect. And uh, I think we've got Tom Horn coming on the second week of July, which is going to be really exciting to talk about this book. But uh, essentially, you know, uh, these molecular genetics at different, you know, these different universities like University of Maryland... Um, there's a Jonathan D. Dinman, Ph.D., and if you Google that or you stick that in your computer, he's um, a head of the Department of Cell Biology and Molecular Genetics at the University of Maryland. He says a zombie virus exists now. So what they've done essentially is, you know that show, I Am Legend, starring Will Smith? You guys know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, that, that, well, anyway. left on, he was the only person left alive with his dog. Yeah, well, the movie opened with a scientist announcing the cure to cancer using a genetically engineered chimeric vaccine that blended animal and human genetics. So if you've seen the film anyway, you know the cure, quote-unquote, results in a human form of rabies that essentially these rabies infect and take over the brains of people, and it turns them into these zombie-like monsters who wipe out most life on Earth. You know, it's probably epidemiologically impossible, but given this scenario... Again, if you Google this fellow, this Jonathan Dinman, he said that there is a zombie virus that exists, and I guess infection, and of course I'm paraphrasing by by memory, but essentially the infection, it's 100% lethal. So it would turn you into a walking dead for at least a while. And he says it causes you to change your behavior by reprogramming you to bite other people to spread the infection. And it's highly mutated. And it's basically something that they've already engineered in these sinister little labs to facilitate these end time army of soulless killers. And it's and this is this is actually fact. I know this sounds like we're reading something out of some little sinister cartoon where somebody's trying to get world domination, but this is yeah, it's really it's like a it's kinda of like a zombie Nephilim virus scenario. And you've got these uh top top-level policy advisors to the U.S. intelligence and military communities, including the Jasons. Those are the celebrated scientists on the Pentagon's most prestigious scientific advisory panel. They've warned in recent years that human enhancement involving genetic alteration, either by design, accident, bioweapon, you pick it, represents a challenge if not exist. Uh, uh, exist uh, sorry, I can't think of the word. But it, they're saying kind of like a... Oh, like a, a scenario that might play out, for example, would be um, if you Google Department of Defense, it's called the $100 Genome Implications for the DOD. This group, again, this think tank, it's the, again, I said the celebrated scientists at the Pentagon's most prestigious scientific advisory council say that these DNA sequencing technologies will usher in new genotypes, phenotypes, and they're, it's like a genetic blueprint to overhaul human beings. So what does that look like? Well, people will walk differently, talk differently, behave differently, look differently. And, you know, that's what high-level ranking officials in Washington are warning. So, yeah, this is not something Sheila sat around and made up. (laughs) Uh, No, uh, Sheila, I just made it. Yeah, that explains some members of my family. Um, uh, (laughs) 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 Uh, But, 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 you know, what we're talking about here from from Ukraine to uh, the, the the collapsing or the uh, the killing off of the dollar to uh, these uh, these uh, viruses to the zombie virus to to, to air, all of this what we're talking about look I, you know what Sheila I lost um, not only friends but family over discussions about this the uh, close people to me saying you know you've you've changed you're you're 
you become more of an idiot than you were, um, essentially. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. That, that They said, we don't believe any of this. No matter how much evidence you lay out in front of people. In fact, I had a, a family member who's having an open house tomorrow. I probably said too much already. Uh, anyway, um, that I just said, no, you know, I, I can't go because the animus between the if I would show up, it just would not. It just wouldn't be pleasant. Um, I, if I'm finding that. Are, have you lost friends, family, because of your beliefs and your information, your truth? Well, I'll take it seeking? one step further. I'll actually take it a couple steps further. Not only have I lost family members and very, very close friends, I've actually got kicked out of three churches because of it. So, you know, one of the things I had a group of elders call me into the church and say, "Listen, we've." senior show red flag <laughs> i said well to help me understand that and they said well here's the problem that we have sheila your show title first of all is weekend vigilante that's a red flag i said well you know by some methodologies jesus christ was considered to be a bit of a rebel a vigilante and it wasn't above him to be flipping over change tables in the you know gangster bangster synagogues there so you know we kind of had a discussion on that and they said okay forget the show title that aside, we're very concerned that you pick on Joel Osteen, man of God, Rick Warren. And I said, wait a minute, you know, let's just step back here. And when I presented that, I presented them with scads of information, a plethora of information, Doug, and they didn't want to see it. They just said, you know what, I think it's just best if you move along, you know, find another congregation to. Uh, and this was three different, this is three different people that said, listen, you need to be a nice little minion and sit in the corner and shut up and just be a normal human being. And I've actually had people say that. So have I had a bit of, um, you know, have I been targeted? Have I lost friends and family members? Absolutely, no question. You know, they kind of wrote me off as some conspiracy theory tinfoil hat wearing kook. And here's the thing, it's not Doug and Joe and Sheila saying this stuff, folks. Do some research. Don't take our word for it. This stuff that we present is all... This is well documented. It's irrefutable. We're telling the truth. But that's the thing. There's such a, you know, it's cognitive dissonance. It's normalcy bias. You know, it's, I don't know what it is. It's a combination of a bunch of different things. But people just are under a spirit of deception, Doug and Joe. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, when you bring the, the sort of a nuisance in as the truth to these people and, you know, even in a polite way say, hey, you know, not, not that you're wrong, I think you're misinformed, take a look at this. They take it as a personal attack on their intelligence. They take it as, uh, in some ways, in other ways, they agree with these people and think what they're doing is good and achieving some kind of unification and peace when the Lord said there will be no peace on this earth. Um, obviously going contrary to what they learn in the Bible. And, and uh, I know what you mean by presenting pastors with information and uh, being told, no, you know, you could show them the, the facts, take them outside, see the sky's blue, and they say, no, no, it's not. Uh, and, and yeah, what you're saying, and Sheila, what you're saying as well, it's, it's, and I know the listeners, our, listener, our listening base have the same issues. They, we cannot even present the evidence in black and white. Obviously, you know, it's kind of like a, um, a child showing a father or a mother. Um, something that, um, or, or you, you know, if you ever have a, a family member become an insurance agent, you, you know that uh, you don't you don't really want to deal with the the, the uh, uh, with them as an insurance agent, perhaps, or buy insurance from them because there's that familiarity. I, I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear, but but essentially, I guess what I'm saying is the members of our audience are very very at least the core members of our audience are very familiar with being ostracized by their beliefs, but even more than the beliefs, but the, presenting the facts, because no one wants to hear the facts. It's just incredible, and it's both on the left and on the right, progressive and conservative. Well, and, and it's and, not just that. It's huh. even one step further, because when you have Christian men, and I mean, I, I sound like a broken record here, but when you have these preachers, Mr. One World Order, Kenneth Copeland, meeting with the Pope, and 
Joel Osteen meeting with the Pope, and you have all these little hucksters off there. And then Joel Osteen actually says, and I'll play a clip of this next week, he says, you know, I just love the fact that it's the church now, what the Pope's trying to do is have it all inclusive. I can't really do a good Joel Osteen impression, but basically Mr. Colgate Smile is happy you that it's more peace. inclusive. So, you know, but here's the thing, Doug and Joe, I'm embarrassed to be part of the church today because I absolutely believe it's an embarrassment to a holy God. I do. And, you know, it's funny because I went to somebody's, uh, somebody's child was getting baptized and I went to uh, a church service the last couple of weeks and I was, I was shocked. I guess I wasn't really shocked, but I was kind of shocked because I, I sat down and music services about get started and these people, we're talking while the service was starting, and it was kind of like this whole, I think I said this Friday on your show with that when I had Steve Quayle and Greg Evenson on, you know, it's kind of like this, stick your feet up on the rail, have a cookie and coffee, just tell me how blessed I am, let's talk about God's supernatural favor, you know, let's have this little happy, clappy, sentimental Sunday service with this, you know, kumbaya, let's have a group hug, and after all these people are talking, all the dribble of the world... You know, and people wonder, Doug and Joe, why there isn't any power in the house of God. Well, why is there no outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Because it's absolutely, we've changed these churches into social clubs. You know, it's all flashy entertainment and blasting rock band concerts. And, you know, we're pointing the finger at the world, but we need to turn to the church and say, you know, we better get on some sackcloth and ashes and humble ourselves because, I said to Steve Quayle, I, when I look at the, the church in the New Testament, they didn't have all these stately buildings or paid telepickpocketists or a lot of money. They couldn't get on TV and beg, but I'll tell you, they turned the world upside down. And what happened to that? You know, you don't believe me, people that are listening. I challenge every one of you to go to a Christian bookstore this week and look at the glossy covers. Ask which ones are the best sellers. And it's nothing to do with God. It's all these little, you know, it's like Joel Osteen's book. I forget the new one out now. And it's like a, the, the man is a motivational speaker. He is not a preacher. And anybody, you know, just forget emailing me about Joel Osteen because I get it all the time. But it's just disgusting to me. It's, it's just ah, theologically the, the, shallow. <laughs> the uh, satanic uh, subtle influence has been allowed to enter the church because of men like Joel Olstein and, and others who promote their own gospels, their own interpretation or version of uh, the Lord's truth. And he has and is now uh, the main deity worshipped in most churches because of the lack of motivation and the lack of uh, seeking the Lord each individual person is supposed to do. Well, and I'll tell you what else is disturbing, though. When you have a pastor who's 45,000-member congregation, I mean, just think about what this guy will rake in on a weekend. I mean, that was not... I mean, if if you're one person and you're making more than your entire 45,000-member congregation, is so, does something flag, you know, red flag that with anybody in your listening audience? I mean, there's something not right with this. You know, when you're bringing in billions and there is nothing, there's crickets chirping on what you're doing to feed the poor, you know, has anybody ever looked into what Joel Osteen and his cronies do? I'll tell you what, they're not feeding the hungry in America, I'll tell you that much right now. Yeah, and, and just so people don't think we're picking only on Joel Osteen, he, he's the uh, poster child for the lack of... Um, well, he's a poster child for others, I suppose. He's a poster child yeah. for the theologically soft Doug. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not as articulate as I should be this evening. When uh, you know, gay marriage and, and is accepted uh, wholeheartedly by not only church leaders and as a denominational group, but by the congregation. When abortion is is not, uh, you know, called out as a sin and it's accepted. When when all these Christians across the world, we have an all-time high number of Christians being massacred for their because they're Christians across the uh, Middle East and Africa and uh, all the persecution and suffering that's going on. Yet we hear what you were talking about, Sheila, these, these people that want to self-promote, that want to make other people just feel good. Um, and, and Pastor David Wilkerson uh, said it best. I think he called it the gospel of accommodation. And it will accommodate that's it right. to any way yeah. you feel or want it, or or whatever makes you comfortable. With that, we're up against the top of the hour break, Sheila. Um, we're going to take that now, and 
We'll be back after these short messages. Yeah, I just want to say, it, it, sorry for interrupting. Yeah, no, I'm not. Uh, I just want to say this, folks. You're listening to a very special, the debut, debut edition of the Weekend Report with the Weekend Vigilante, Sheila Zelensky. We're going to be doing this every Saturday. I'll tell you something. Um, it's a sacrifice for you folks to listen sometimes, I, I, I think. Um it, you're deliberately listening to this program. We want to deliver to you. We want to leave you with more information. We want to leave you with b- better equipped uh, than when you came at the beginning of the program. That's our goal every week. And Sheila delivers 100% of the time. And it, her website, weekendvigilante.com, if you feel blessed by what you hear, um, she's really the one making the extreme sacrifice for this. So, so I would urge everyone to support Sheila Zelensky at WeekendVigilante.com. The link is off of HomelandSecurityUS.com. Yeah, um, she's a... Um, wow, an intrepid person. You know, two different networks um, having to, to to move away from one and, and uh, having issues with the other network that picked her up after that that were out of her control uh, and being blamed for it pretty much and thrown under the bus. Yeah, without a yeah. chance, you know, she's had a pretty rough time, and it's not because she uh, is not a good radio host. It, it, oh, she can run circles around us, and yeah, absolutely, and uh, we need to support her. So, absolutely, um, yep, you're right. Anybody who who has the means, uh, definitely, you know, donate uh, to help her cause, or if you can't donate, pray, uh, give her prayers, send her an email, whatever you got to do to uh, uplift them. Yeah. To, to help her out. But with that, we're going to... Well, but, but one more thing, housekeeping. If I could just plug my... <laughs> you take uh, us out. Then. Okay, I'll take us out. What the heck? If I can just plug uh, something here. I, I wrote... Uh, I finally found my inspiration, I think. I did write an article. Of, it's called... The title of it is called From Potomac Fever to Denial Virus. Since we were talking about the zombie virus earlier, I thought I'd mention this. From Potomac Fever to Denial Virus. It's uh, posted on HomelandSecurityUS.com and CanadaFreePress.com. Uh, if you if you read it, like it, share it with others, because, um, in fact, there's a discussion area at, at CanadaFreePress.com. We don't have that function on our website, but Canada Free Press does. Uh, tell, your, tell people about it if you like it. It, it kind of gets into um, what's going on today in a larger, bigger picture sense. With that, we're finally going to take the break. We're going to be right back with, well, it's Sheila Zelensky, Weekend Vigilante. And uh, Mr. Dave Hodges is on the line, and we'll bring him on after the break. Um, We're going to be playing right now News in Two Minutes brought to you by Full Spectrum Survival on this Saturday, uh, first Saturday edition of the Weekend Vigilante and Hagman and Hagman Report. We'll be right back. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of News in Two Minutes, bringing you the news that you need to know every day. Let's begin. A controversial and telling study that links Monsanto's Roundup herbicide and genetically modified corn with tumor growth and serious overall health declination in laboratory-tested animals has been republished following a redaction that is believed to have been led by powerful lawyers and organizations within the genetic modification industry. The study, which was published in a 2012 issue of Food and Chemical Toxicology, won worldwide recognition for displaying the obvious dangers of genetic modification and toxification from pesticides and their connection to life-threatening diseases, was originally redacted by the publisher following what is reported to have been taxing threats from multiple industrial leaders and pro-GMO scientists, which led to a discrediting of the toxicology methods involved. Following the redaction and in the midst of an ongoing battle against worldwide genetic modification, the study and its results have once again been published in a world-renowned journal, Environmental Sciences Europe. Research that we have performed in combination with publicly available data provided by the U.S. government currently indicates that up to 90% of some crops within the U.S. have been genetically modified, including large quantities of both corn and soy, leading scientists within the community to call for continued understanding and heightened awareness of the potential threat that ongoing genetic modification presents both to the community and to all of humanity. As volcanic activity increases across the world, seismologists are publishing increasingly proven data showing that buried underwater volcanoes play a large role in the creation of tsunami-causing earthquakes, leading researchers to call for international monitoring of known volcanic sites worldwide. 
A study published in the journal Science and backed by researchers that are against man-made climate change outlines the logistics that scientists use to map and forecast cyclical climate change, with researchers noting that disruptions in the trends of oceanic currents correlated with and possibly enhanced extreme shifts in Earth's weather patterns long before man-made climate change was invented. Authorities in India are calling for help from international experts following an ongoing outbreak of acute encephalitis within the country. The cause of the disease, which continues to harbor a dangerously high mortality rating within the affected areas, remains mostly unknown, leading experts to warn that environmental dangers may be enhancing the effects of the illness within the population. And to wrap things up, cross-border tension between immigrants and law enforcement is intensifying. Concerned citizens are calling for increased testing along North America's western coast as models show oceanic radiation is expected to hit the shoreline soon. A novel but potentially equally as dangerous nuclear reactor that uses a wide range of fuel has been started in Russia, and a 5.1 in Japan followed by a drastic increase in activity across South America completes today's Quake Watch. And that's it for this episode of News in Two Minutes. Check back tomorrow for more news that the aware need the most. You better wake up fast and listen to this, America. The Obama campaign has launched attack squads disguised as truth teams dedicated to intimidating and silencing all political dissent carried over the Internet that criticizes the Marxist Obama. Truth squads specifically focused on covering up Obama's endless trail of lies, corruption, and subversion, and using the Gestapo power of our own government to police and censor the Internet and shut down websites that dare to carry the real truth about Obama's Marxist coup. Remember the names of these Gestapo-style agencies at work right there in your neighborhood. KeepingHisWord.com, KeepingGOPHonest.com, and AttackWatch.com. KGB, SS, and Gestapo-style police state gangster organizations at work to silence the important voices of patriot dissent, some of which have already been shut down by Obama's orders. Adolf Hitler would have been proud. We're the 21st century Tea Party Patriots. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this first and special Saturday edition, uh, the beginning of, of many Saturday shows we were going to have with Sheila Zelinsky uh, from the Weekend Vigilante and the Hagman and Hagman Report teaming up together. Uh, tonight, <clears throat> we have another guest we are bringing on right now. His show is the Common Sense Show, and has ha- Dave Hodges uh, is his name, if you're unfamiliar with him, but he's been a guest on our show uh, several times, so I'm sure a lot of you... Uh, read his his articles that he has put out as um, they are um, alarming at times. And they- I don't know how he does it. I, seriously, I, you know, it takes me forever to write an article, and he, I, I don't know, he just sits sits right down and pounds them out, and uh, it's it's like it, you know, I'm still trying to uh, uh, make the words. Yeah. Or, uh, I'm still know. writing articles from 2011. Yeah, well, you, yeah. Anyway. Uh, we'd like to welcome, uh, first of all, let's bring Sheila back. Sheila, uh, you're back, right? Yes, and I want to just mention, Dave Hodges, honestly, is a good friend of the Weekend Vigilante, and I'll tell you, he is a brilliant, articulate, and and I love the beginning of his show, it says, Dave Hodges is as mad as hell, and he's not going to take it anymore, and I'm going to tell you, folks, this man is a man of integrity, he is an amazing, amazing fighter of our freedoms, and I kind of coined the term the instigator of the airwaves, and I'd like to welcome to, personally to the program, Dave Hodges, welcome. Well, it's uh, my pleasure to be on this maiden voyage with you, Sheila, and <laughs> Doug and Joe, and, 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 and Doug, I really don't write those articles, and I am not using levity when I say the following. When I sit down and I'm concerned about something, I just simply say a little prayer that I will be done, and the next thing I know, it could be three or four hours later, and I'm done. And and I, I feel that a lot of what I do is inspired, and this is what my calling is to do. Well, you, you do it well, and as Sheila said, with character and integrity. So we we just we love you a lot, Dave. And, and folks, I'll second Thank what you. Sheila said. I I know Dave, uh, I believe uh, rather well, and I, I'll tell you this. Uh, a man of character, integrity, very tenacious researcher, attempts to verify all of the facts. He's been through hell in his life of late, as we all have, you know. But but some more than others. And and Dave's been just been, been smacked around. Sheila's been smacked around so much. Um, I, it, it's getting a little bit irritating to me. Uh, I got to tell you that, that people will 
go off and uh, attack the messenger, attempt to stifle the truth, and that's why we, you know, this debut here includes you, Mr. Hodges. Um, Sheila, let's turn it over to you and Dave. You guys, just we're going to kind of stand, step back a little bit, stand out of the way. Um, that way, you so we're not falling all over one another. I do know I can hear a delay here in a reverb coming back to me. So Sheila, go ahead and take it. Well, I'm going to just, uh, first of all, I'm going to open up with uh, telling your listeners that if they didn't catch the show we did before with Dave, I really encourage them to uh, listen to that show. We were really essentially talking about Dave's fight against the Virginia CPS, and there's so many links to make with this. And kind of there's some real ominous and nefarious connections that Dave and I have sort of, you know, we've thrown some stuff back together in our investigations, and we've come up with some pretty nefarious tentacles. But first of all, I want you to start off by, Dave, just give us an update on where things are at, um, out with Monica Wolskowski. And I'd love to say, first of all, kudos, Dave, for launching this big legal uh, fund, I guess, for lack of a better word, for her, because I really believe this woman is absolutely getting just screwed over in the, in the nth degree with this you know, very devious CPS organization. So give us an update on that. You know, tell us how people can also, you know, we'll just start open with just saying people do get behind this legal fund. Anything you can spare would be greatly appreciated because, you know, it affects us all. There is an absolute war on the family. There's a war on the Christian family. Conservative Christian families are really coming under attack. And, you know, if we don't fight for the, I mean, if we don't stand for something, I think this is just, you know, we don't deserve to do anything if we can't stand for our kids. So give us an update on that, and then we'll get into some other things, Dave. Okay, thank you, Sheila. And uh, I have never done a fundraiser of uh, this kind of nature before, ever, not one time. And uh, this is how much I believe in this case. And quite frankly, I wouldn't have known how to do this kind of a fundraiser had not one of the readers to my article I wrote on Monica and her son Dylan uh, who was stolen from her inappropriately and illegally by the Virginia CPS. But I had a reader write in and said, Dave, try to use this source for a fundraising source. They're reputable. They're easy to access. People are familiar with them. And you might have some good results if you wanted to raise funds this way. And sure enough, yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of rolling. But here, here's where we're at. We originally set a goal for $10,000. And I, w I don't know much about legal costs in terms of dealing with CPS. Um, and I thought 10000 might do it. So did Monica. Well, that covered the retainer. So then we upped the goal to twenty, and we're finding out that's going to be woefully short. Monica had an administrative hearing on Thursday. She had two attorneys, and she had to pay for a court reporter, and the costs are astronomical. So now we're shooting for thirty. So if people go to my website at thecommonsenseshow.com, and it's the top article, and it uh, talks about my appearance with you, Sheila, and if people scroll down about halfway down the page, they'll see an electronic link to where they can make a credit card donation, and if they're not comfortable with that, there's also a snail mail post office box. Now, to date, we estimate that we've raised uh, between snail mail and electronic donations about twenty two to twenty three thousand. The company itself takes nine percent off the top, which is their profit. We think we need to get to thirty thousand and that's a ballpark estimate at this point. Uh, this stuff is expensive. Monica was forced to pay for uh, a, a, a psychologist not a psychologist but a therapist. Uh, to evaluate her on a continual basis. She had to pay for the psyche vow that she went through. Yeah, the, the costs have been exorbitant, and not to mention the time away from work. By the way, Sheila, let me mention this. Monica's had her son taken away, and this is the first time someone's hearing this case. This is so shocking. She's had her son taken away for no reason whatsoever. And they thought she was such a security risk to her son that they initially gave the son to her neighbors to where Monica had absolute and unbridled access to her son. And then it was only when they brought up the fact that you need to take a psyche valve before you get your son back, and she said, I'll be happy to comply, but I'm a State Department employee with a security clearance, and I have to run this by our attorneys to see if this doesn't violate my security agreement. And at that point, one of the CPS agents grabbed the paperwork out of her hand says, you're losing your kid. The son was taken right from the, the, the neighbors that Monica knew well and gave the boy to two homosexual fathers 
which is complete violation of CPS regulations because Monica is a committed Catholic, and in the eyes of her religion, homosexuality is an abomination in the eyes of God, and therefore this boy was placed in a foreign and, to her way of thinking, a hostile environment. And then the allegations came where this boy was uh, being molested. We don't know if it was the two uh, stepfathers. We, I can't say that for a fact. But Monica presented me with some photographic evidence that if this were given to me in Arizona and given the fact that I'm a former mental health counselor and I'm involved in education, I would have legal report requirements to the authorities. The boy was also running around moving his arms in sexual gestures, saying, Mommy, cut my arms off. Mommy, cut my arms off. Now, this is a four- and then turned five-year-old boy. Taking a bath was a painful experience for the boy. Use your imagination, because I don't want to be too graphic. So Monica compiled all this evidence. She took it to CPS and the Department of Family Services and the local police and the local county attorney, M. Chris Siegler, and none of them moved to investigate this. And they're supposed to, by law, if there's any question, remove the kid immediately from the care of the step-parents and find a safe haven while they investigate the charges. This wasn't done. They violated their own procedures. They were negligent in the welfare of this child. This is horrific. Now, let me step aside, Sheila, and just mention this for the listening audience's benefit. What prompts this? Well, first of all, every CPS, and all parents need to know this, every CPS across the country is paid money by the federal government to come take a kid. When they show up at your home, they are your enemy. They're worse than the Russians, the UN, or the Chinese. These people are there to take your kid because their budgets, their promotions, their informal quota systems that they all have are there to, if they take your kid. Also, if the, if the boy or the girl has a minority designation and, and Monica's ex-husband was named Rodriguez, that's even worth more money to the federal government. And because her son Dylan is on the autism spectrum and qualifies as being disabled, then that's even more money the federal government play, pays to the Virginia CPS. So they're incentivized to steal children, and this is what they do. Now, the police and SWAT team gear showed up the initial night when they seized the boy, and the police didn't see reason to even charge her with anything. Uh, they said, uh, well, okay, we've got to have CPS come in, and they said, you strangled your kid. Here's a red mark on the back of his neck. Well, the neighbors who got Dylan initially took him to the pediatrician, and the pediatrician concluded, and I've seen the report, that there was no abuse, that this was an eczema patch, dermatitis. And this was the basis. If the police had evidence that she would have strangled her kid, they would have arrested her immediately on the spot, which they did not do. So people say, well, why was she targeted? Well, CPS is incentivized, but she also works in the State Department. And what's interesting and concurrent to this is I was doing an investigation into Benghazi, and some of my off-the-books sources were telling me that Chris Stevens wasn't just running drugs to purchase guns to give to al-Qaeda to promote regime change, but he was into kitty sex trafficking. And I started writing about this. This is also what led to attacks upon me, which caused me to do a strategic withdrawal and take my website down for two and a half days, thinking no one would notice, and boy, was that ever wrong. So to kind of lump all this together... Uh, I think Monica has been targeted because she is a conservative right-wing Catholic who has an NRA bumper sticker, and as a consequence, she's working in a, a, an organization now that promotes the gay and the green agenda, and they see her as a fish out of water. She's perfect whistleblower material. Whistleblower about what? Well, Monica wasn't involved with Chris Stevens. She wasn't involved in Benghazi. She does do highly secure things that I'm not going to talk about here because it's not relevant. But she did have an acquaintance in her uh, apartment complex whose little girl played with Monica's son. And this man just happened to be a whistleblower providing people like Congressman Frank Wolf in Virginia evidence on child sex trafficking and high-level government involvement. And this man met a very suspicious and untimely end. And as I began to look at these facts, and these are my conclusions, not Monica's, although I think she's kind of come to see the light of this, 
I believe she was politically targeted because this federal employee without any outside income was targeted for a detailed audit by the IRS. That makes absolutely no sense. And they began to drug test this nine-year veteran of the security department with no history of disciplinary issues. So she was targeted because of her conservative views. And the Virginia CPS has now got their back up because they haven't found many people like Monica who will stand up to them and who's intelligent enough to play the game at their level. And then there was one other thing they weren't counting on, that she'd bring it to my attention. I would have a wonderful reader give me a tip on how to raise this kind of money, and we'd be able to mount a legal defense against this criminality. And now we've got the Virginia CPS scrambling for cover. Well, Dave, and I think we know uh, by now we have an epidemic of these child abductions from the CPS around the country and how they're basically outright stealing kids from law-abiding parents parents who are doing nothing wrong in the raising of our children. You and I have talked about good old Hillary's, um, or Hitler as I like to call her, you know, it takes a whole village to raise a child, you know, that this, these sinister, nefarious statements coming out of these, these people. But here's the thing that <laughs> well, I think... Sheila, let me just interject this. In Monica's case, it would take the village people, if you know what I mean, to raise a child. <laughs> the two gay fathers, yeah. Well, I mean, isn't that something? And, you know, it's mind-numbing to peer into the reach of the shadowy forces associated with these CPS agencies across the country. Just ask the late state senator, Nancy Schaefer, as you know, Dave, she mm. met an untimely end while exposing the international component of, you know, the parts of these alleged nefarious practices. And you're keenly aware of the tenuous nature of those investigations. And But here's the, you know, this is what I have come to... I guess in my research, Dave, I started really thinking about the last show you and I did. And I started really doing some digging in a couple of names because, of course, you and I had talked about Colorado. We would talked about um, some of these nefarious people. But, you know, I started looking into uh, some state policy and I started looking into and I come across a little institute called Progress Missouri. Have you ever heard of it, Dave? No, I have not. Well, Progress Missouri is the parent company of Progress. It's another company called Progress Now. The Show Me Institute is also a member of the State Policy Network. Interestingly, well, anyway, here's the question. So who's funding Progress Now? The Gang of Four. Pat Stryker, oh, Jared Polis, Tim oh Gill, goodness. and Rut Bridges. But guess who else is funding it? They fund uh, a little George organization. Soros, I would guess. George Soros, because they're, the Colorado Democrat is, uh, Dem Democracy Alliance CODA is closely tied to the Democracy Alliance. Now, interesting, guess who just gave them a massive donation? But here's the other interesting part. So if, if your listeners don't know Doug and Joe, Stryker, this Pat Stryker, she was catapulted into Forbes 400 after inheriting billions from her medical devices tycoon grandfather, Homer Stryker. So she owns shares of a company called Stryker Corp who, well, they were also investigated, just so you know, for a Medicare scandal in 2006 and again in 2012. And the scandal was actually not just very interesting information about um, these overbilling for Medicare, but the other sinister thing was they were looking at developing a bone growth mixture, uh, which is really interesting. It never went any, it never went, underwent any clinical trials, but they were, you know, illegally selling this bone growth mixture. And what was really interesting is the Koch brothers are connected to this. They had another little organization that was really interesting. They're also all part of the Defenders of Wildlife Action Fund. Well, who funds Progress Mission? The, game of, the Gang of Four. So the State Policy Network, again, is related to the Democratic Alliance. Who funds that? Sheila, let me has... ask you a question here before you go on. Yeah. At, at this point, I'm wondering if you haven't found a link between these groups and Common Purpose. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what this links into. Yes, That's I what do. What we're talking about here with uh, Monica's situation, where her son could easily disappear into child sex trafficking, which is happening all across the country, where CPS just magically loses kids. Common Purpose is run by the Queen of England, and the Queen of England has already been convicted in the European Court of child sex trafficking. Well, and what's really interesting is Pat Stryker is a Fort Collins, Colorado philanthropist. 
just like good old hedge fund billionaire George Soros is a so-called philanthropist. Oh, and the Koch brothers, aren't they philanthropists too, Dave? Wink, wink. But anyway, this is interesting because she owns the Bohemian Foundation, and the Bohemian Foundation actually owns Bohemian <laughs> Airlines. Do you know where I'm going with this, Dave? <laughs> Do you want to know a little interesting thing about one of the stops that the Bohemian Airlines makes? Go ahead. I'll let you uh, expand on that a little bit. Um, ask me the question again. Where do you think the Bohemian Airlines makes frequent stops? Well, Diana Hunter traced them to uh, resort towns in Mexico, Del Rio, Texas, and Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Hmm, interesting. Well, we happen to know that there's something interesting about Amsterdam, don't, don't we, Dave? Yeah, but it's... Let me put it to you this way. There's what you think is true. And there's what you can prove. Yeah, exactly. And, and, yeah. and, and that's why I want to be careful here. Do I have sources that have implicated George Soros in the child sex trafficking? Yeah, and his $2 million donation a few years ago to NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association, speaks clearly to the kind of pervert that he is. But when it comes down to some of these other people, there's some smoke, but I can't say there's fire because I can't get credible people to go on the record because they're afraid. Well, and this is the problem. I think we have a lot of insiders that definitely are pinpointing some interesting thing. I mean, these guys have a web of highly efficient operations, such as the Green Energy, the Defenders of the Wildlife Action Fund. You know, you've got to remember Soros and Stryker and the Koch brothers gave a total of $4 million to the Coalition for Progress. Well, who are they? They funded Democratic Party-elect at the time Barack Obama. So it's just really interesting how, you know, you start connecting some dots. It gets to be a very nefarious little gang of Well, there, you're right, it? Sheila. Pat Stryker actually attended Obama's initial inauguration. My understanding is she paid $5,000. She attended. She was a big friend of the president. Um, I, I wouldn't say these are her words, but when I go back and I look at some documents and some stories, I would say George Soros was probably her mentor. That doesn't mean that she necessarily embraced the nefarious side of George Soros, but what it means is you have to wonder why someone who features herself as, as a uh, so-called philanthropist, and she has given to charity generously in Larimer County, but why she'd be associated with such a heinous pig like George Soros, who likes to collapse economies, wreck lives, and cause the deaths of tens of thousands of people. Um, I wouldn't choose to hang out with people like that, and I'm surprised that she does. Um, there's a lot we could go on and say down this avenue, um, but let's put Stryker out of the, the, the picture just for a second, because I have no evidence that she's involved in the following. The Gang of Four that you bring up has, has an association in two different directions through associate members. One is with the Franklin scandal, and one is with the Jean Benet Ramsey murder. Do you want to go there? Yes. Yeah. I want to emphasize that Stryker, uh, her name does not enter into these things, so I don't want to do the guilt by association. But Soros' name does. Uh, Tim Gill and friends of the Gang of Four, they're all friends and hang out and are connected with in various ways to John Ramsey. And let's, let's just look at the Jean Benet Ramsey situation just a little bit. There was one talk show host in Denver who, by the way, was recently shown the door. His name's Peter Boyles, and he can be a really annoying so-and-so, but he did do some investigative work on the Ramsey case, and it was really clear that in the Ramsey case, there was a ransom note that was faked and written by Patsy Ramsey, the mother. This is no secret. This leaked out into the press, but the press tried to hush it up. Alex Hunter, the DA in the case, refused to prosecute the parents for complicity in the death of Jean Benet, their daughter, and they should have. In fact, uh, Kelvin McNeil, who was the county attorney, our county uh, public, public relations guy at the time for Boulder County, where this uh, crime took place, went nuts publicly against Alex Hunter. Peter Boyle covered this extensively on his talk show. I was back visiting my mom for a few weeks in Denver, and I couldn't wait to get up every morning to hear Peter Boyle go off on this because this wasn't appearing in the mainstream media, and he was bringing in witnesses. Well, what's interesting to Kelvin McNeil, he gets fired 
from his government position, he goes to work for Stryker, and this has nothing to do with her implication in this, but he ends up going to Amsterdam, and some at some point, does, and, and we don't know if he was assigned to go there, did he go there on vacation, but he died in a hit-and-run accident. I don't know if he, you could say he was silenced, but uh, if you were to ask me if there was a nefarious part to this, I, I would point directly back to the Ramseys themselves. And John Ramsey had a company that was um, uh, a subsidiary of Lockheed Martin, and it was headquartered in Amsterdam. He frequently went there, and that is the capital of child sex trafficking on this planet. Again, it's an implication of guilt by association. Could you go into court and win? But as I said, there's what you think and what you can prove. And I have had unnamed sources tell me more than I can reveal here and I really, and Sheila, you know why. You know why. I've told you why. I can't come out and name names on this because people could die. Yes. And I'm and talking that, about friends down yeah. south, if you know what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah. And, and I and I'm certainly will never, ever put one of my sources at risk, which is why I get good sources. But this is downright frightening when you look at, like, the Jean Benet Ramsey case and the so-called seances they used to have there and the people chanting these satanic hymns. This is what the neighbors were saying on Peter Boyle's show. I mean, I'm you, it was the best entertaining radio in America for the three weeks I was back in Denver that one year. Uh, this whole thing then pointed into the Franklin scandal. The Gang of Four is also associated with Herman Cain, the Mr., you know, I can't keep my sex drive under control, Herman Cain, when I'm running for the Republican nomination for president. Well, at the time all this uh, went down with the Franklin scandal, Herman Cain was the head of the Kansas City Federal Reserve, and uh, he was brought in to clean up Lawrence King's scandal. Now, he had uh, embezzled about $400 million from a bank in the Omaha area, but that wasn't the biggest problem for the elite. Opening up this scandal opened it up child sex trafficking directly from Boys Town, and it implicated high-level politicians and corporate people and the sex parties in Washington, D.C., in which politicians would be videotaped and this information would be used against them. I've interviewed Nick Bryant, who wrote this classic book, I consider it to be a classic, called The Franklin Scandal. He's right on board with these kinds of conclusions. And what's interesting is this uh, gang of four is close with Herman Cain. Herman Cain comes in, cleans up the mess, and basically kills the evidence trail. And I do mean kill. Uh, you can take that literally. Kills the evidence trail with some of the whistleblower kids that just managed to somehow disappear, die mysterious deaths, or were so drugged out of their mind that no one would take them seriously. And, and, and so you have this interwoven network of high-level elite people, George Soros, members of the Gang of Four, the Ramsey Associates, Alex Hunter, the DA at the time, covering up the crime, and high-level politicians. In fact, you know what else Nick has uncovered, and I found the same thing. When you look at that uh, Sandusky case out of Penn State, yes. uh, the media was hot onto that until it ended up at the seat of the governor's office in Pennsylvania and started to make its way into the halls of Congress. And all of a sudden, someone flipped a switch in the media, and that story disappeared. Child sex trafficking is at the heart of what they wanted to cover up. And this, it's, well, let me tell you how far they'll go. In the Sandusky case, back in about 1999, Oh, gosh, the names jumped out of my head, and you can tell I'm doing this interview on four hours. Uh, but the uh, county attorney for Center County, and why can't I remember his name, but the county attorney in Center County had received information about Sandusky's sex, tra sex abuse of kids. And he first chose not to look in it, into it, but the accounts were um, oh, Ray Greikar, that's his name. And Ray Greikar chose not to look into this initially, but then he jumped on it. And he started investigating, and where there's smoke, there's fire, and he found evidence that it wasn't just Sandusky, it was the Second Mile Foundation. Well, about a week later, they never did find Greikar's body, but the FBI did find his laptop in a creek bed, but they said it was so damaged they couldn't get information off of it. That's how far these people 
who run these child sex trafficking rings are willing to go to cover up their crimes where they will murder, you know, a county attorney. I mean, to me, that's almost incomprehensible that this could go on and this crime could get ignored. And really, when you look at the newspaper accounts of the day when Greg Carr died, they were even questioning, why isn't this being looked into? Why isn't there a full-scale investigation? It was almost like he died, so what? We got his laptop, game over, nothing to see here, folks. Dave, you're, you're talking uh, the, under the Casey administration in Pennsylvania, correct? Dave? Yeah, yeah, I lost you there for a second. We had a little cutout. I apologize. Yeah, uh, no, I, I think I think it was on... Uh, it, we, she was dropped off, and she's back on now. So okay. we're yeah. having a, a couple. We're hearing glitches here and there, a little delay. Uh, yeah, big surprise, Dave. I wanna I wanna jump in here because I just read a London Telegraph article yesterday, Dave, on Jimmy Seville, and it's really interesting because I was, you know, Brandon Tuberville successfully linked proven British pedophile Jimmy Savile to Prince Charles. So it's really interesting. They haven't touched that story with a ten foot pole. You know, the connections between the two, as pointed out in the Tuberville article, are undeniable. And it was really interesting. I mean, pretty hard not to conclude from that, Dave, that Prince Charles did indeed traffic in stolen children. And, again, the Queen is no stranger to child sex trafficking as well, as you alluded to. Well, you're you're right, and that's why when you were talking about this organization out of Missouri, you said some magic words, and I said, oh, that sounds like Common Purpose, which is the Queen's organization. And uh, it, we do know that uh, she's into some satanic, you know, child abuse ritualistic behaviors, and some of them get expressed through the activities of common purpose. And uh, this has been known to us for quite some time. Well, uh, and I we have Aaron, uh, Diana Hunter did some reports on my show about this, and I had yeah. Brandon uh, on as well. You mentioned him on my show a number of times, and uh, in his last visit, he detailed exactly the relationship between Savile and the prince. And uh, he, Savile even served as he and, and Diana's marriage counselor during yeah. the difficult times. Did you, did you come across that? Isn't that something, hey? Huh. Yeah, he, he and the uh, prince were exceptionally close. In fact, you're right, he did serve as a marriage counselor of sorts to Prince Charles. And the connections between the two are something else. But what's really interesting, and people, we have to remind people, Dave, too, Um, You know, more recently from this past March, the UK High Court Justice Fulford, a longtime advisor to Queen Elizabeth, was named as a co-defendant along with Pope Francis in an international court proceedings that looked into the involvement of cleric child abuse. So, you know, trafficking rings and evidence covers, you know, cover-ups and, you know, of course, Judge Fulford, the huckster, threw out about 30,000 pieces of evidence in a 2011 Hague case. And and it actually implicated former Pope Joseph Ratzinger to child rapists. So, you know, the same um, Brussels International Court issued arrest warrants on Queen Elizabeth and former Pope Joseph Ratzinger. What happened two days later is he resigned. I'm I'm sure that's just coincidental, though. Well, it also kind of implicates all the uh, child sex scandals we've had with members of the Catholic Church clergy in this country. And I'm not impugning all Catholic priests, uh, but there's been enough of these cases that we need to ask why. And we might be learning the reasons why. Uh, Ratzinger is, is a bad, 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 bad person. Oh, yes. There are accounts coming out now, and I'm working on validating this. I, I, I think there's enough that I could probably write about it and have some credibility, but, but I want to close the loop. You know, it's... Um, uh, I even hate to mention this because it's so horrific, but uh, the Royals hunting children for sport, and Ratzinger was allegedly involved in this and witnessed putting a child to death. Well, it's and, the live uh, hunger it, games unfolding before our eyes, only more nefarious. It's not one person that's saying this now, it's two. And that that strengthens the claims, but I I still think we need more. But it's kind of like, where would more come from? It's not like they're going to invite, you know, ESPN in to cover the games. So, you know, I don't know where you go to really validate this more. But I don't have a hard time believing it, guys, because 
if they're willing to be implicated in sex trafficking and, and the queen's already been convicted, then this is just a short step to the next level. But, but, but the other disturbing part of it is, too, Dave, the two fellas that um, there was an original source that originally came out with old Pappy Bush's um, do you remember when Paul Rodriguez and George Archibald reported in the Washington Times back in 89? They were reporting this Washington, D.C. prostitution ring. Well, yes. the person that originally broke that story was hit by a bus. I mean, I'm sure that was no, uh, you know, it's not interesting. You know, it, essentially what this was is it, it made intimate connections with the White House all the way up to Pappy Bush. Male prostitutes had been given access to the White House in the article, and of course, you know, there was minors that were abducted for use in child sex trafficking and were pimped out to delete. But here's the thing. The claims, as you alluded to, all these kids that just get dismissed, they were dismissed as fantasy. But the former Nebraska State Senator John DeCamp, he later investigated the claims and he was horrified to learn that they were indeed legitimate. And Pappy Bush was implicated in DeCamp's investigation. Isn't that interesting? Um, yeah, and I'll give you a Pappy Bushism. A lot of people like to go back and talk about his drug running uh, with Zapata Oil, and I'm sure you've heard of this. Yeah. Uh, now I'm getting some stories that uh, kids were involved in this uh, economic endeavor as well, too. Uh, so he has a history of this, and his name frequently comes up when it comes to child sex trafficking. Uh, but unfortunately, and someone that I'm very disappointed to say his name is beginning to come up too, and, and I wished I didn't feel compelled to say this, but it's Ronald Reagan. He supposedly had an affinity for young kids. It, and that greatly disturbed me, but you, you come across this information enough. Let's just say it's almost like their pastime. We know well, it's their pastime yeah. when they go to Bohemian Grove and carry out their satanic, whatever it is they do, but child sex trafficking, kids end up there, uh, ritualistic sacrifices happen there. Uh, there is enough stories out there to validate this, but it's much bigger. It's on a ground scale. It's part of the underground economy. Money gets laundered into banks like HSBC Bank to cover up the profits of child sex profit. It's very profitable, very, very profitable. And Dave, uh, it, it's so disturbing that we're so depraved as a race. You know, uh, my friend Steve Quayle and I were exchanging uh, emails the other day on the topic of can we pray enough to turn back the scourge on our country and push this back to the final days to another generation. And, and Steve is of the opinion that it's too late for our country. We're under judgment, but it's probably not too late for individuals. And I have to say, you know, when I stopped and pondered what Steve said, I think he's probably right. I think we can only be responsible now for the, our own souls because we are so depraved as a race. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you mentioned the uh, amount of evidence that's out there, you know, detailing what goes on with the Bohemian Grove and all the different tentacles that uh, they're into. But I just wanted to mention, you know, there, there's, efforts out there you know you have these right wing and left wing uh, hosts and different people on t uh, cable tv and brad Meltzer is one of them he does the the coded show and i remember yeah. this uh, vividly he talked about bohemian grove and he said um it would be like trying to interpret what they do there would be like coming into a, a christian church giving communion and hearing them say here's the body and the blood of christ you know eat it and and not understanding what it truly means, trying to justify it. And you have the, you know, the Glenn Becks and other people who mock uh, the Bohemian Grove. And it's um, to a well, point no, where... No, no, mock those, those people trying to expose it. Right, right. Sorry. And, have you um, ever seen the video where uh, Newt Gingrich gets confronted on Bohemian Grove and his highly defensive Shakespearean, I think, thou doth protest too loudly response. <laughs> I saw yeah. David Gergen, um, not Newt Gingrich. Uh, I think Alex Jones interviewed David Gergen. And, saw that too, yeah. I saw yeah. that one too. And it's depraved. L let me share something with you that I've come across in the course of this research in the past couple of months. And I've had some people who are CPS agents former CPS agents, one of them has agreed to come on my show later this summer when she moves from her location because she fears retribution for speaking out. 
but when she moves, uh, she'll bring this out. But kids just disappear. I wrote an article last year about 80 kids disappearing from the Oklahoma CPS system, and they acted like nothing was wrong. But I found out how these kids, at least in part, go from CPS to child sex trafficking rings. And now what we have on the one end is we know they disappear, and then we know that groups like Wells Fargo, Wachovia, got busted for participation in this. They paid a $400 million fine. No one went to jail. Uh, DynCor, which was their name at the time, got a similar punishment. No one went to jail. But what's really been missing until I've come across this in the last two months is how kids actually end up going from CPS to child sex trafficking rings. It's not like the CPS agents are physically delivering them. I found no proof of that. But here's what I have found some proof of, both from some of the stories of various CPS agents and also from people who have investigated this. And and what they say is that the CIA and other corporate types will front foster parents to go into various communities. They write them a very favorable background and profile. So in other words, they're creating an identity for them that will make them appear to be uh, good foster parents. And they gather six, seven kids, and they just disappear. And the question that I asked everyone that I talked to on this, well, why aren't they filing a missing persons report with the FBI? Why aren't these kids' faces on milk cartons and so forth? And the answer is we attempt delivery of the payment that we give to foster care parents, and if they re- if the payment's not received, then we assume they just move to another state. And this is where most of the investigators who look at this will tell you this is the point when these foster parents turn the kids over to whomever and they go to another state and procure more children. And we're not talking one, two, or ten. I asked this question for one researcher afraid for his life, afraid to come on the record until he feels he has enough support that he's so public no one will dare go after him. And I said, good luck finding that. But he told me, he said, he, he thinks there are thousands of these kind of fake foster parents that are given created identities designed to steal children. But Dave, here's the, here's the really nefarious piece of this. And why is it, though, that it's absolutely crickets chirping about these 80 kids missing from Oklahoma? And by the way, people, those naive people who would never believe that the leaders of this world could be complicit in participating in the elite-controlled sex rings on the planet, I would have to uh, say you don't know how you know, in-depth this satanically inspired practice goes clearly because, I mean, obviously these people are despicable. There's no question. But I think it's just absolutely mind-numbing that you're not hearing anything. In fact, even when you Google it, there's nothing. It, there's no mention about it, Dave. Well, I, I agree with you, but it's so pervasive that when you do find out about it, it, it even impugns the, the reputations of people who associate with them who may not even be guilty. And I'll, I'll give you a name and case in point. Pat Stryker, you know, there's no proof she's involved or guilty of anything in this regard, but, but she's hanging out with George Soros and people who've been implicated in this. That harms them. And then you look at our own Senator John McCain right along the same lines. He's implicated in hanging out with people like this. The governor of Colorado, Hickenlooper, he, Hickenlooper he's yeah. beholden to the Gang of Four. And the Gang of Four, let's put it this way, has some strong ties into George Soros's more nefarious, sexually perverted, uh, financially driven and supported interests. And, and so a lot of these people probably aren't involved in this at all. But it's like there's no tentacle that but it doesn't. Dave, why why are these the same hucksters or the who's who of the globalists, the Koch brothers, Pat Stryker, uh, the governor, the front range mayors? Why are they the same ones spearheading a, a, a movement to enslave the people of Colorado under the dictates of Agenda 21 too? Well, that's it's a good so- point, and and we've been covering that now for about three years, where Stryker, the Koch brothers, Hick and Looper, the front range mayors. Uh, that means basically from Fort Collins to Colorado Springs, are all in cahoots to try to get control over water. Let me give you their proposals on this. This is really upsetting. It's illegal to trap rainwater, um, and, and that's because I believe they're going to drive the price of water so high that's what people will try to do. Second thing is um, they make it illegal now. I think this goes in effect in 2017 
to farm more than 50% of your land. You can't till more than 50%. Well, this is going to cause a lot of wasted farmland. A lot of crops are going to go to waste, and you're going to have serious food shortages that are going to result in incredible food inflation. And, and that's just an example of some of the things they're doing. They're also trying to consolidate all the power companies under one house so they can charge what they want. Um, and I talked to a lady in Pagosa Springs the other day who's fighting about this. She said that uh, there's two power companies in the region with her and Durango, her company, and Pagosa, and the company in Durango, and they're trying to get them to merge, and the people are fighting. But this is what they want to do, and it's all under Agenda 21, controlling all the vital resources so they can control all the people. Now, let's talk about who is definitively involved in this. Pat Stryker, Governor Hickenlooper, every single mayor of any city of any size along the Front Range in Colorado because they're getting the Agenda 21 federal money. And it, you, these people all are involved, every single one of them. They're selling their own people out, which, you know, the joke of the day is, and people with Colorado who know what's happening, the reason they made marijuana legal is so we wouldn't care what the hell's going on. Well, and you know, did you know, Dave, that Stalin actually brought in Fred Koch in order to develop the Soviet Union's oil industry? Uh, seems kind of interesting that his sons are bringing a virulent form of communism to Colorado and other places, too, isn't it? Interesting. Well, that's what Agenda 21 is. Yeah. You know, ultimately, it's about uh, making energy um, so high and food shipment, you know, the 3,000 mile salad so expensive that you all have to move to an inner city and eat the soylent green that they're going to give to you. And uh, and don't laugh it, when I say that. Yeah. I, I had Barb Peterson. I, I, I subbed for John Statmiller the other day on John's show, and I had Barb Peterson on. And uh, <laughs> uh, let's just say this. She is highly suspicious that things are ending up in our food supply that should not be there, like uh, baby's fetal tissue that's been aborted. Ending yeah, up well, in, our, in our food supply. Yeah, I, I, it, it and, gets worse than that, too. Yeah, like, we'll I, I know. I know. <laughs> but it's soy it green, and they want to control everything and, and push us into these stack and pack, you know, 250 square foot apartments. And they're already building them in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, you know, Pat Stryker is behind that movement. She's the, I call her the queen of Agenda 21. And uh, they have these apartments in Fort Collins that are just these micro-apartments, and you're not allowed to have cars. And Fort Collins tried to ban all cars in downtown Fort Collins unless you were an eco-friendly car. And this is all Agenda 21 takeover, so you're absolutely right. Colorado is, well, California, too. California is right there with them. But they're the beta test for Agenda 21 rollout, and I think they're working out the bugs there soon to come to every other state. Well, and again, you mentioned the Koch brothers, and they're they're trying to now raise the retirement age to 70 to get their mitts on retirement too. So, I mean, it's, their tentacles are in everything. This, the little who's who of the globalists. Is that? Would you agree with that? Well, yeah, but you, you can't consider the retirement in isolation. The banks have almost no liquidity right now. I mean, you got interest rates at almost zero, which is insane, and you've got a situation to where the economy is on the verge of collapsing. The good news is we only have a $17 trillion deficit. We have a $240 trillion unfunded mandated liabilities like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and so forth. And then the derivatives debt, you know, the bailout, let's steal the people's money to pay off the Wall Street hucksters. Okay, that is estimated to be between $1 quadrillion and $1.5 quadrillion. And the only, well, let's put it this way, the sum GDP total of the planet Earth is about $96 trillion. And we're talking about a $1.5 quadrillion debt. We could pay bailouts until the 30th century, and we would not pay down this debt. The economy is going to collapse. Absolutely. That's why they're grabbing the retirements. That's why the MERS mortgage fraud's in place, and they're trying to grab as much liquid, hard asset as they can, because when the crash comes, the banks want to have everything of any kind of value and get rid of the things like the stocks and the so forth. This is why Goldman Sachs did a put option or a short sale option, I should say, on gold last year. And then when the price got driven down, they and their cronies uh, went out and bought up as much gold as they possibly could. The upper-level banksters know what's, going, what's coming. And what's coming is a crash, but they're going to steal the people's wealth from them before the crash comes. 
Well, you're absolutely right. And then the interesting thing is uh, when you start looking at, and you've talked about this, and of course we'll get into this um, after the break in more detail, but you've talked about the the coming water and food issues, and I, I really do, and Tim and I have talked about this before, Dave, water is a huge issue, and look what's happening with the water right now. Well, you mentioned Colorado. They're, they're after control of the water. Uh, no question about that. You've got T. Boone Pickens, who is buying up the Ogallala Water aquifer, Reservoir, yeah. which is the l- largest underground water aquifer in the United States, stretching yeah. from Texas to South Dakota. He gets control of that. It's game over. He can control pricing and distribution for about one-third of the country, I've been told. And then you've got the uh, Great Lakes. Uh, Jesse Ventura did such a marvelous job covering this in his show, <laughs> where the, the, the water is being taken from the Great Lakes and given to people like China and India and and so forth, and, and these uh, the Great Lakes are, are soon going to be a shell of themselves, and so water supply there is being drained. The UN is moving in to take over control of Detroit's water. In Isn't fact, some something, yeah, talked about in the, the second hour. Yeah. Yeah. The UN is going to be controlling a lot more than Detroit's water. There are UN military vehicles all throughout this country. I have published the videos, the pictures. And in my last three articles, I've talked about here's what's coming. Well, and if you look at this Colorado climate change, you talked just about Gen Colorado, but I've got inside sources, and there's a Colorado farmer that has lost all of his farmland. And we're talking about a, a, a person that has had this land in his family for 250 years. So, I mean, the state legislature and the Colorado Supreme Court are forcing Colorado farmers to forsake the use of well water in the irrigation of their crops. And, you mm-hmm. know, Deborah Tavares has talked a lot about these Californian nightmare water policies. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's just classic Agenda 21, and it's ultimately they don't want you in rural areas. They, it's illegal, like you said, to trap rainwater, reuse irrigation water, and 50% of all the farmland cannot be tilled under these proposals. I mean, we're talking about the complete destruction of not just Colorado farming, Dave, but an installment of Agenda 21 policies in every state in America. Stalin gained control of Ukrainian food supplies when they wanted independence, and he murdered 20 million of them. Well, isn't it interesting that Colorado gun confiscation is so on the radar, too? I'm sure it's not just a coincidence. Well, it's uh, not a coincidence either. The U.N. is advertising for people to seize guns in their New York office. I wrote about that as well. Well, there's, I'll jump in here, Doug and Joe, because there is, uh, we've got a lot to talk about in the next hour if we haven't scared your audience into uh, shutting the radio off. Well, you know what, it's, it's our audience. And I just want to thank you, Dave, uh, uh, Mr. Hodges, for coming on. I look, I know you've only had a minimal amount of sleep, so it's amazing to me how you can be so articulate, so uh, on point with uh, such little sleep. It's, uh, it's interesting. Folks, I, I hope this last hour, man, if, it, if this last hour didn't rock you off your, your seats, I don't know what will. Um, it was incredible information. We are facing the top of the hour. Folks, you're listening to the inaugural broadcast of the Weekend Vigilante, Sheila Zielinski, and the Hagman and Hagman Report teaming up to bring you the Weekend Edition. And um, I, I've got to tell you, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be a part of, of this, this broadcast. Sheila, I want to thank you so much for for everything that you do, and Dave, everything you do as well. Folks, we're right back. You're listening to the weekend edition, inaugural inaugural edition of Weekend of Jelani, Agman Agman Report, our special guest, Dave Hodges. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our third and final hour of our first broadcast of our new Saturday edition with Sheila Zelensky from Weekend Vigilante. And our guest, Dave Hodges, it's been a great first two hours. We have uh, covered some news in the first hour with Sheila, and uh, Mr. Hodges joined us in the second hour and covered some serious, important, and sad topics. Uh, you know, the case of the cases of the children being abused in the, the federal government, in some cases, uh, in the states aiding uh, in the uh, abuse and, and kidnapping and, and killings of these children. Um, and the whole CPS system, I mean, it's every angle of society, everywhere we turn, whether it's, you know, taxes, whether it's uh, 
you know, firearms, any kind of freedoms, uh, they're all been gone, and we are now living under a tyrannical um, democracy, as they would say. Democracy, uh, indeed. Yeah. Uh, you, folks, you have to go back and listen to the second hour because there's a lot of important information there. Sheila, we're going to turn it over to you. Well, Dave, you touched. I want to get into the UN and how they're positioning themselves here to bring in martial law lockstep here. But I want to finish off with this water thing because, Dave, you've, you've chronicled water a lot. And I think what people are failing to get here is the globalists, through their government minions, are in the process of destroying massive bodies of water. Now, you talked about Great Lakes, not limited to Chesapeake Bay, the, the Mississippi River, the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, talk about what the globalists are using to do this, too. I mean, you have talked about Crexit and nitrates on a show before with me. Get into that for the listeners, because I think that that's, you know, we're definitely not hearing about that in the, on the 6 o'clock news. Well, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, because you're looking at a situation like involving the Chesapeake Bay, uh, where these uh, farm chemicals, nitrates, for example, are being dumped in there. Uh, killing off the life, killing the productivity of the land adjacent to the Chesapeake Bay, posing a dramatic health hazard to the people. There's been uh, some well-intentioned efforts on the part of local politicians to clean up the Chesapeake Bay, but because it's a multi-jurisdictional body of water, you know nothing's being done. The EPA will come and push you off your land because you've got a puddle of rainwater on it, but they won't do a darn thing about the Chesapeake Bay. And it's because they are happy to see the degradation of drinking water supplies. And in the Gulf, no one's talking about the Gulf anymore. And uh, next year, when we come up on the um, fifth anniversary, I'm going to have to reopen some of this. Uh, as you know, Sheila, I wrote a seven-part series on the Gulf in which I showed how it was a conspiracy, how money moved. And I also covered some of the ecological damage done to the water table. And, and, and let me address this for a minute because it's still going on. Corrects it's still being sprayed at night in the Gulf, and I've got reports from people who've been on the cruise, people who observe it, and corrects it mixes with the oil that's still leaking, and it creates highly carcinogenic effects. In fact, the uh, Wilma Subra did a random investigation of people's uh, benzene levels in their blood, uh, and she did this about three years ago, and she found that people had up to 65 times the amount of benzenes in their blood system in the Gulf than you find in other places in the country. And what happens is when they drop this Corexit in the water and it mixes with the oil, then it gets evaporated up and becomes part of the transpiration cycle. And so as far away, and this was reported until it got scrubbed on a Memphis TV station, that Corexit rainfall was wrecking the crops and the crops were all turning white from it and were failing to thrive. And it's also in our water table. We know about the massive sinkholes in Louisiana that dominated the news about a year and a half ago. And all of a sudden, that disappeared. Well, the sinkholes didn't disappear. And what's ca causing this to happen is the highly corrosive water that's made its way into the water table and is causing a degradation of things like the salt domes. And you get these massive pits in the land. And in some places, uh, like in Cornville, Louisiana, they're as big as a mile wide, and it basically has shut down a state highway. So the water supply is horribly impugned. And then you've got Fukushima, and I just heard a, another news report today out of California that they're going to get hit with another big burst of radiation. Well, the radiation just doesn't settle. The radiation also ends up in the weather patterns, and when the rain comes to the earth, it ends up in the water table. So our water supply is being polluted. It's becoming more radioactive. So let's take a person genetically, Sheila, who's a, um, they might have a tendency towards a certain kind of cancer, or let's say leukemia. Radiation is reactive in, in leukemia. So let's say they have a tendency towards leukemia. But if they have a good, sterile, pristine environment, their genes may not act upon bringing out and manifesting the disease because they don't have the environmental push to do so in this interaction effect between nature and nurture. But if you introduce these kinds of elements into our ecology, then you have a situation where people who have tendencies towards some of these illnesses will be pushed over the top and these illnesses will manifest much earlier in their lives than they should have to. I made a bold prediction when I was writing my seven-part series called The Great Gulf Coast Holocaust. 
and I said that I believe 40 years out, 50 years out, and the next generation looks retrospectively, if we're around to do so, at what happened in the Gulf, that we could see uh, life cycles diminish, lifespans diminish by as much as 10 to 20 percent. This is how widespread I believe this is. And a lot of it has to do with contamination of our drinking water, which is absolutely huge. But more concerning is when you look at T. Boone Pickens, and, and how uh, various forces around the country, like in Colorado, they're acquiring all this massive amounts of water under one authority, well, they can create a shortage simply by pricing the product out of existence where people can't afford to pay. In Bolivia, where the Bolivians were promised by the World Bank and Bechtel that, hey, just let us come in, loan you some money, and we'll clean up your water supply. Your kids won't die of cholera. So they came in. And immediately they quadrupled the water, and they're doing all the things they're doing in Colorado, prevented trapping rainwater, reuse of irrigation water, hurt the crop industry. And this was for Bolivians who were living on $6 a day. And and this is what's coming to this country if we survive long enough. I think there's some intervening well, variables that might make this Well, Pickens, point. Dave, isn't exactly your average hedge fund manager now, is he? And plus he has... He's got more shares in Suncor Energy, Marathon Petroleum, also BP, ironically. So very interesting that prominent globalists are attempting to buy up as much water as possible to really exacerbate the destruction of water resources in these areas. So, you know, you're looking at water scarcity. That's what America's really looking at here. You know, that's complete subjugation, really, isn't it? It really is. And you, you mentioned you wanted to get in to the UN, and I've got a segue for you. To do this. <laughs> Good thing. Uh, and you already know where I'm going with this, don't you? Yeah, I probably uh, do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The man's name is Peter Sutherland. Peter and Sutherland, our good pal. Fighter. Yeah, and, and, you know, Peter Sutherland will be involved in population redistribution and migration in this country, mark my words on it. But uh, this isn't the first time I've come across Peter Sutherland. I came across him in my uh, Gulf investigation. Peter Sutherland used to be the CEO of BP. And about a year before the Gulf oil explosion, he was given a position at Goldman Sachs called a non-executive CEO, whatever that means. But he was also put in charge of moving Goldman Sachs money. Well, what's interesting is, and and I won't belabor the Gulf crisis much, but just to show his background and what he's all about and blend it into what's happening today with the UN on our soil. What Peter Sutherland was was able to do through Goldman Sachs is he executed, for example, a put option on Transocean, the owner of the oil rig, the day of the explosion, the very morning, and they double indemnified the losses for preferred insiders. This was a Peter Sutherland Goldman Sachs action. And so when the oil rig was destroyed, Transocean made $270 million, and Goldman Sachs made about $140 million. He also uh, facilitated the drop or the dumping of BP stock, uh, both with Goldman Sachs. Uh, He also helped facilitate a deal uh, between Halliburton and Transocean that they hired Halliburton 10 days before the explosion. And who uh, who did Halliburton link with? Boots and Coots. What was Boots and Coots' involvement? Uh, They were the biggest oil cleanup firm in the world. They knew the explosion was going to happen. It was a false flag. And Peter Sutherland was at the heart of it. He knew the inner workings of BP, and Goldman Sachs was the command and control center for all the money movement. And all these people made tremendous money. In fact, even Obama made money on this. He was involved in a fund called Vanguard 1 and 2, and Vanguard 1 and 2 was heavily vested in uh, organizations like BP. Well, about two weeks before the explosion, his handlers and Vanguard 1 and 2 took the president out of that stock. He would have lost somewhere around $100 million had he stayed in that stock over an eight-year period. So this was Peter Well, I have Sutherland. another beautiful segue, Dave. Mr. Bilderberg, Peter Sutherland, also attended, as you know, the the recent Bilderberg meeting, and he was allegedly talking about the UN's role in the next couple of months. Isn't that interesting? What would be the UN's role? So did you find it interesting, Dave, that that, that some of these positions posted with the UN, 
destabilize, uh, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration positions. I mean, isn't that something? Well, you're talking about the hiring of basically military-grade officers or guards, fancy guards. They also use terms like uh, small arms confiscation. Uh, reintegration to me means re-education. Um, and what do you re-educate from? You re-educate from a FEMA camp if you're lucky enough to come out of it. And as a consequence, I have to reflect back to Bill Ayers, who launched Barack Obama's uh, political career right from his living room. And Bill Ayers told Larry Grathwall, the late Larry Grathwall, former FBI informant, that when they win, they'll have to put 50 million Americans into concentration camps, and they'll have to eliminate at least half of them. And that's, I believe, the philosophy that this president has, and the border crisis is the linchpin. This is the first of the dominoes that's going to roll down the rest of the dominoes that will lead to gun confiscation in this country along with martial law. And it's going to be the U.N. using the foreign troops that people like Doug and I and Joe and Steve Quayle have been talking about now for two years. They're going to be wearing their little blue helmets. And the precipitating incident is the border crisis. Now, because I'm here in Arizona, I am privy to local news coverage that the rest of the country is not getting. These numbers of illegal aliens coming into this country are being greatly under-exaggerated. I first began to cover this story as, gee, they're bringing in all these underage juvenile females, and they're going to be sex trafficked by the Mexican drug cartels who are in cahoots with Hamas and Hezbollah and the CIA. And that was the avenue that I was looking at. But lo and behold, I began to see something even more nefarious. This president and Eric Holder has been facilitating this crisis going back to at least January, because if you go to FedBizOps, there is an advertisement there for escorts to bring across the border and to provide them with lawyers for a minimum of 65,000 illegal immigrant children. And they knew this was going to happen, which tells me that you've got the CIA down there in Central America posting notices, parents, it's the children's crusade. Send your children north to America. They'll be well cared for. I don't even need to see these. I know they exist because these people just didn't wake up one day playing on the playground with their friends in school and say, you know what, let's go get on this train called the Beast that leaves Nicaragua, and they transport over a half a million people a year to the, to the border of the United States, and they, people get robbed, they get raped, they get thrown off the train when they don't have money to pay the cartels. People get sucked into the wheel wells trying to jump onto the train as it rolls to their town because it won't stop everywhere it goes. It's a horrible, horrible existence. These people live on the top of a train for a number of days in terrible conditions. I don't, wor- 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 I don't wish on any human being. They defecate in the same area they have to sleep in. They often don't have food and water. The people die of dehydration. This is what this administration is sponsoring. And then those who make it here without dying are looked at like, oh, gee, it's a humanitarian crisis. Mark my words. We're seeing this postured right now in the media as a humanitarian crisis. We're also seeing simultaneously to this the appearance of still photos and videos of U.N. military vehicles through the southern part of this country. In some places, we're seeing them even in Minnesota, Idaho, Montana, and so forth. But primarily, they're in the southern part of this country. Now, where does Peter Sutherland's role come into this? This gets really interesting. Peter Sutherland is also the head of the Migration Council of the United Nations. So if you needed to do a mass relocation of people, Peter Sutherland, Mr. Bilderberg, Mr. Former Head of the Western Europe Trilateral Commission, he would be your guy, and he's the guy who would facilitate this kind of crisis. This will give the U.N. legitimacy. I can hear the speech now. Barack Obama gets up. 
We need to welcome the UN peacekeepers, and the crisis on the border is of such a magnitude that we do not have the resources to fully respond to help all the people. So we're thankful to the UN for giving their time, their efforts, and their peacekeepers to our southern border, and we encourage everyone to welcome them and cooperate with them. This will give the UN legitimacy to operate on our soil, and they'll have a presence in four states. Now, how do you get from four states to the other 46 states? You have an economic collapse, subsequent food riots, social unrest and chaos, massive violence. Well, you've already got your peacekeepers here, so start rolling out the blue helmets to the rest of the country. That's what I see coming. Well, I want Doug and Joe to jump in here, but peacekeeping is normally the euphemism reserved for gun confiscation and population subjugation, is it not, Dave? You beat me to the point, Sheila. You're right on the money with that statement. Unbelievable. Jump in here, Doug and Joe. The the phrase target-rich environment, when you talk about blue helmets, comes to mind. Now, please, folks, uh, I'm not, you know, look, I'm not advocating violence at all, but... uh, uh, if you have an international uh, peacekeeping force, I, I suppose my 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 whole concern is: um, are, are people are people going to react in that fashion? It, like I just said, um, uh, you know, the, the fighting the United Nations troops is that going to be? Dave, I, I'm interested in what, what you're taking on, Dave. Do you, do you think that that the people will put up resistance because UN troops should not, not be on the soil? Well orchestrated plot. I don't even think the military leaders that knows what's going on are going to be able to mount a resistance because the UN will be here only as a peacekeeping, uh, humanitarian aid organization. They're doing very little policing activities. They're simply trying to save lives. And who's going to win a public relations battle with the American public if you oppose people who are feeding people who are dying? Uh, it's all this is going to do is it's going to legitimize the UN's ability to operate within our territorial borders. And then when the economic collapse happens, then we're going to see the lights go out. But there's going to be an event in between those two events, and that's the false flag event that will legitimize taking the guns. But Dave, and I'm not sure what that's going to be, but I'll give you I a guess. My... What? What yeah, country was it that just went through an electrical grid takedown? It was Yemen. 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 I think Yemen was a beta test for what they want to do here. If they're going to take down the grid, it makes sense that they used Yemen as a beta test to see how people will react and how best to respond to gain control. But I'm going to link a story you wrote about a month ago, Dave. Why are Russian and Chinese troops participating in our takedown drills? I want to know that. Well, if they're going to put on the blue helmets, I think that's your answer, Sheila. Well, I've got another four-letter word answer, FEMA. (laughs) Well, it's all intertwined. Um, I've written on this, too, this week, and I believe it was either the first or second article that I wrote on this UN takeover. Um, I talked about how last fall, between July 1st and uh, uh, November 13th, uh, FEMA and DHS conducted at least nine major uh, martial law resulting drills from catastrophes, from cyber attacks on banks to grid X2 and the takedown of the electrical power grid. It also involved uh, 386,000 troops. And I'll get pretty close to a quote here. It's in one of my articles this week in which these 386,000 troops were taught to speak English, learn Americans' weapons system. And let me step aside with that comment. Maybe this is why DHS is acquiring 2.2 billion rounds of ammunition Mm -hmm. and 2,700 armored personnel carriers. They're storing ammunition for the, quote, peacekeepers. Well, I think what the point is, it seems to be that no one's talking about, I think, a major problem. And you're pretty much the only person other than Doug Hagman that has mentioned this, Dave, is this idea of foreign troops on our soil. What the heck I want to say something worse, but I'm going to clean it up for air. What is going on? I mean, post-conflict management, why are they throwing that? Is that another euphemism reserved for one of two possibilities? And you know where I'm going, Dave. No, they're here, and they're here by design. Uh, And uh, I I think it's more than Doug and I. I know Steve Quayle has talked about this a lot. Hawk has talked about this a lot. Well, a Um, handful of people, yeah. 
Uh, there's a number of people out there that are aware of this. My military sources are keenly aware of this. And, and the people who say, oh, no, that just can't be true. Well, look at some of the photos printed on my website from the Colorado Springs Gazette that pictures Russian soldiers wearing blue berets, uh, take, having their picture taken in front of Fort, Fort Carson Army Base in Colorado Springs with Army soldiers. They're there. They're here. In fact, I even have linked in past articles to a FEMA bilateral agreement signed by FEMA and the Russian Defense Ministry in which they agreed to exchange thousands of troops for defensive purposes. Um, they're here. They're well, here. and the grid, X, the grid X drill was the most concerning because they rehearsed an EMP attack, and that yeah. really concerns me. I, I would have bet even money in September of last year that we were going to see the false flag come out of that uh, Grid X2 drill. It had all the signs of a false flag event. Uh, as we got closer to the event and I learned that the Russians and Chinese were brought into it, I backed off my prediction of a false flag and says, now they're not going to do the false flag with the Russians and Chinese like that. This is a training exercise for a future event involving the power grid. Do you know what's also interesting, too? We have these war games in the Pacific every year the RIMPAC war games, the largest war games in the world, and we prepare against the Chinese and the Russians for Pacific battles. Well, the Russians and Chinese were invited into RIMPAC this year. So who are we preparing for? It's my contention they're putting together an international peacekeeping force, and they're going to be preparing for the American military that stands up to them and to subjugate the American people. So the tenets of martial law, there it is. Jump in there, Doug. Well... Uh, I think this is pretty well consistent with the information we talked about in the first hour that um, uh, we we had, and, and Dave, I, I'm sure you saw this, we had a, a Chinese flag flying at the Dallas uh, Federal Reserve office. Essentially, I believe, uh, and this is from Jim Willie in an interview with uh, Rick Wiles, I think this past week, that uh, uh, where where he talks about the uh, the fact that the Chinese now own 30% of down, of all of Manhattan commercial property. He believes, uh, if I understand him correctly, that uh, the Fed has already been collateralized by the Chinese or is owned by the Chinese at this point. I agree with that. Look at it. Yeah. Okay. okay. I agree so, with that. So, yeah, all we have to do is take a couple of steps back and look at what's happening. And you're not hearing anybody uh, talk about any of this, uh, which to me is sickening. You know, it's all bread and circus uh, with respect to the uh, uh, conservative talk radio. Come on now, you know, let, let, let's let's talk about what's important here. Well, it all starts to make sense when you consider the following actions in combination with each other. It's kind of like you look at an elephant and you say, describe it. Well, I see this big leg. I see the trunk. I see the floppy ears. I see the tail. Well, when you put all these elements together, you get an elephant. Well, here are some elements I think that the American people need to be aware of and look at them in their totality, not individually. The first one is the MERS mortgage fraud, in which the Federal Reserve and Congress is looking the other way as the major banks continue to steal home mortgages and that's going on. The second is the fact that the Federal Reserve for uh, months spent $40 billion of printed money to acquire home-based mortgage securities. Uh, that's huge. And then you've got the fact that you've got J.P. Morgan interests beginning to be bought up by the Chinese, other banking interests. There was even a news release that the Federal Reserve gave the Chinese permission to buy into American banking interests. And these are the same banking interests that underwrite and basically control the Federal Reserve. Well, what's the Federal Reserve doing? They're acquiring hard assets, particularly in the real estate industry. And what do we owe the Chinese? Lots of money. I believe the Chinese will soon absolutely constitute our landlords, and they will own your home mortgage, and they'll be dictating terms. And it's in repayment of the debt. Yeah, Chinese are going to own the Fed, which Fed lends your bank, so they'll own our 401ks and our mortgages too, Dave, and everything else. Uh, everything. Get used to well, these rolls. Right. Here, here's your uh, yeah. Well, you, you you better get used to hiding because the Chinese are known for not taking prisoners. But the the thing that I um, that that really concerns me here too are these uh, solar energy zones. And this was, you know, it wasn't just the Bundy land rights that was bad enough, and Harry Reid's corruption with his sons that was bad enough. But the biggest thing that came out of the Bundy Ranch affair, in my opinion, 
was the fact that it was revealed that a company called ENN, which is owned by the Chinese military, was given the rights to have these solar energy zones on various properties throughout the country. And most of these solar energy zones are located over huge mineral deposits which lie underground of the solar energy zones and the Chinese own this land now. I also read a report and I wrote on this about a year and a half ago. I said we're not broke and you go into the fact that we have about $128 trillion of estimated underground mineral resources that aren't even being tapped or leased. And I was saying this is crazy why would we not tap into this resource during these tough economic times and we put people back to work overnight? Well, if you've promised this to the Chinese, which is what is in the, in the process of happening right now, this is why we're not even touching our own mineral resources. The Chinese are going to own it. In fact, I'll even take this a step further. When the U.N. takeover for martial law takes place and they come for the guns and they have the FEMA lists and the camps and the red lists and the blue lists, it, it will be the Chinese and the Russian soldiers that are here. I've been told the Chinese are going to get the hard assets, and this comes from my two best military sources, and the Russians have been told, well, once the people are taken from their homes, you can plunder all their property. So, and Dave, these are the guarantees that are made to these troops that are here. Well, essentially, I mean, we're talking 100% owned everything because this, I mean, that whole Bundy thing you talked about with ENN, I mean, it was a clever scheme to sell off below market value of very valuable land, mineral, and water rights to communist China. Like you just mentioned, the large investment zones of America owned and controlled by communist China corporations, and they're only accountable to China's government, not ours. And just as we see these foreign countries owning toll roads and ports throughout the USA, They've turned our energy grid over to foreign countries, is what you're saying. So if Chinese, there's, I guess, a Chinese ownership of everything, ports, factories, town, energy now, is what you're saying, all these solar and geothermal projects. You know, and it's interesting that George W. Bush administration, at that time, don't you think it's funny, Doug and, and Doug Joe and Dave, that they were not allowed to buy interest in ports, but of course, Obama administration overturned that. So we continue to borrow all this you just mentioned the trillion dollars, Dave. So when Chinese collect their debt, essentially you're talking about complete boots on the ground ownership of everything. That's what you're talking about. Yes. This country is in the process of being carved up like the proverbial Thanksgiving turkey. You mentioned the porch. Just look at what's happening at Long Beach. Um, if you want to bring in a nuclear bomb and explode it in the port, I don't think it's going to happen in Charleston despite uh, what a good old senator from uh, South Carolina said last year, <laughs> yeah. I think it could happen in Long Beach because nobody will be looking. Well, I guess China. Well, the Bank of China has advanced plans to convert China holdings of U.S. debt into equity, so they're really playing their debt card for all our land assets and resources. That's about what you're, what's going on here, isn't it? Well, yeah, and, and here's what no one's talking about, and, and I'm going to bring this up because I've never heard this discussed on a talk show anywhere. If you strip the people of all their resources, in other words, at some future date, the survivors in this country after some minimal resistance, they won't own their homes, they won't own anything, the bank accounts and retirement accounts and everything will be gone. You'll be living hand to mouth. You'll depend on the government to survive if they're willing to help you do that. Uh, what happens to the people? Because at that point, when the people don't serve any real purpose, uh, can't they be looked at as commodities? And if they're a useless, obsolete commodity, well, what do you do? You retire them. In other words, kill them. If they are not obsolete commodities and you have a use for them, what else could you do with them? Well, you'd do what any businessman would do. You'd put them to work. It's called enslavement. And I think well, this lies yeah. for future, and I don't yeah. hear anyone talking about this. If I can interject something here, what, ladies and gentlemen, what do your family members, friends, the people that think you're nuts, what in the hell do they think uh, China is buying uh, commercial property all over the United States, manufacturing property all over the United States? You know what this is for? This is for your children to be making their goods. You see, the sweatshops are going to be comprised of 
your children and your grandchildren. And this is what these people, uh, the people that, that we're, we're talking to, don't understand. It, it, this is about you work as a slave laborer or or you're useless, and if you're useless, then <laughs> you, where do they put you? In the ground. End of story. Well, let's connect some dots here, Dave and Doug and Joe. Let's think about this, the grid X, the cyber attacks and hacks, the beta testing, the shakeouts, the martial law, and throw the UN peacekeeping in with it. What are we talking about? Tenants of complete, like Dave just said, enslavement and subjugation. You know, it, it's it's unbelievable how this has all been just absolutely orchestrated to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's but to me it's it's child's play. And, and I'm sure Doug and Joe and Sheila, you'll agree with this. Once you cover these uh, miscretins long enough, you come to realize that they, they have a very familiar playbook. And so it's kind of like when I was coaching college basketball. If I played against the same coach three or four times, I kind of knew what it was going to happen. I knew what his strategy was going to be. And that's how I feel about the globalists. So to me, if people are paying attention, none of this should be surprising. Can we win? Uh, I mean, uh, in practicality. N- not from from a Christian perspective, because we in the in the end I know we we win. We're fighting from a, a vic- position of victory anyway. But I'm talking about the people of the United States. Can we win against this? Can we? Are, are, are there going to be pockets that will fight back against these uh, um, UN peacekeepers and so on? Yes. Uh, can we win? I don't know. It, that that possibility is diminishing by the day. If you go back to Benghazi, the height of resistance against Obama and his treasonous ways was at the apex. You had General Ham, the head of AFRICOM, and Admiral Gayet, the head of Carrier Task Force 3, jointly launching a rescue mission to rescue the ambassador and his bodyguard contingent. But they were both arrested by their number two, which happened to be CIA, and, and then taken care of. Uh, that would have been a military coup because they were in direct violation of presidential orders as delivered by Leon Panetta and Hillary Clinton. That was mutiny. And that, to me, if, if, if can you imagine if Stevens had been saved? Would he have gotten angry enough to say, hey, I've been betrayed, and by the way, let me tell you what else is going on. That would have been a heck of an interview to conduct on the Hagman and Hagman report because he might have sung like a canary. He had to die. (laughs) They killed him to cover up the fact that he was running drugs to support regime change by giving guns to al-Qaeda, funded by the guns. Then it was coming out. He was uh, into child sex trafficking for the same thing. And this was in September when he was killed. The general election was in November. That's why he was killed. And if he had survived and the military would have felt emboldened by their treason, against the president, good treason, by the way. There's good treason and bad treason. Uh, They would have been emboldened. They would have stood up. And then Obama started ripping through the ranks of the military. See, this is really, he was firing a lot of generals before this, but that's when really the carnage started with our military leadership. And now I look at this, and, and I thought a year ago, and I agreed with what Jim Garrow was saying out there publicly, that there will be a rising up of the military against these forces. I'm not so sure now. I think they've been so stripped of their leadership. Uh, I just don't think that they see a way that they can stand up and be effective. Do I think individual pockets will resist? Yes, I do. Will it be enough to be uh, enough to turn this around? I'm not so sure. I would doubt it. Uh, I'll just say this on the record. The only thing, and then I'll go back to what Steve Quayle told me, the only thing that I think can save this country right now is prayer and the intervention of God. But we have strayed so far from his word. If I were sitting in God's shoes, I'd have a hard time. I'd have to swallow hard for I'd come down and help. We're under judgment. That's what Steve said. And maybe prayer will help us individually, but collectively as a nation, I have to say as much as I don't want to believe what Steve said, I think there's a greater chance that he's correct. We've created our own bed. We've messed in our own bed, and now we're living out the karma. Well, and ask yourself, Doug, Joe, and Dave, what's the one thing this administration could do that would guarantee a violent response from Americans? Taking the guns. 
Bingo. So, you know, Dave, you just talked about Jim Garrow alluding to the litmus test when Obama, it was over 260 senior military officers were fired by the uh, bathhouse Barry for not embracing the future need to fire on American citizens. That speaks clearly to the point you're making, because look at how hard they're pushing right now for the gun confiscation. And I mean, it is mock speed. There is no question and when, when Kerry signed the UN Small Arms Treaty Ban uh, in, in defiance of our treaty arrangements under the Constitution, which says the Senate has to approve it by a two-thirds vote, they signaled their intentions right there. Um, and I'm telling you right now, guys, I'm as sure as anything I've ever been sure of that the UN uh, vehicles and their troops are here in the form of the Russians and the Chinese – uh, it's all starting. We're seeing it right now. We're seeing the humanitarian crisis being manufactured in the spirit of the Hegelian dialectic, and the UN's going to appear to be the good guys to come in and save the day, but it's their foothold into the subjugation of this country. Hey, are, do, you, do you expect, and i got to ask this, because when you talk about gun confiscation, we already have gun uh, essentially gun registration, which, gonna, which is going to lead to confiscation, but the fact of the matter is, uh, well, my question, I suppose, is this. Do you expect uh, compliance or do you expect a bloodbath? I, I, I'm trying to wrap my brain around the scenario that's going to play out. Well, I, I feel I have a, a reasonable expectation of being right in the following. There were two landmark scientific studies done in the field of psychology back in the 60s. One was called the Milgram Experiment and another one was called the Solomon Ash Experiment. Without going into detail, what both experiments measured was people's likelihood to go along to get along, to uh, go along with authority figure orders, even when they knew it was wrong. And that number comes out to between 60 to 70%. And I think a good number uh, along those lines, 60 to 70%, when ordered to do so by the authorities, and it will be an incessant order, You'll be given deadlines. First, they'll give you incentives. Hey, we'll give you a loaf of bread or $5 or whatever. But then it'll be do this or else and do this because we'll consider this to be an act of violence against the existing government, and you could pay the ultimate price. 60 to 65% will go along initially. And then I think as they chip away at people's resistance psychologically with threats of violence and incarceration and so forth, I think at that point you'll even get that number higher. They know they're not going to get 100%. But if you were going to face 100 soldiers on the battlefield and you could instantly um, do away with 60 to 65 of them, you've won a big battle. And then if you chip away and get that number up to 80 then you're fighting a much more minimal force, and they're basically trying to disarm America through attrition and lessen the threat level. Wow, that, that, that's pretty doggone frightening, but, but I can see where, where you're coming from here. Yeah, in the Milgram experiment, uh, I'm very familiar with, we've talked about it on our show during the week now, um, but, but Dave, do you think that there's, because of shows like yours and, and Sheila's, ours, isn't there uh, an awakening, a growing awakening? And if there is, would that hasten their, their um, would that require some sort of uh, moving up of the timetable of whatever they're about, to, whatever trigger they're about to pull, metaphorically speaking or allegorically speaking? They actually did a follow-up on Milgram, but because of the ethics concerns with the early Milgram experiment, they did it with animals. And and, and rather than uh, faking, shocking people to death as they did in Milgram, it was uh, to euthanize harmless puppies. And what they had done uh, also in the study, they did it in two different control groups. One group was just, they said, hey, go do this. It's what you're supposed to do. And they measured the compliance rate, which was identical to the Milgram rates. And then on the second group, what they did was they gave prior education about your duty to stand up for what's right. It's kind of like what they supposedly teach military officers to disobey an unlawful or unconstitutional order. And what they found there were those numbers went down dramatically into the 40th to 50% figure. So, Doug, your point's well taken there in terms can prior education basically increase one's resistance because we know that when guns are confiscated, as they were 17 times in the 20th century, in each time a genocide resulted at the hands of government in which, according to the University of Hawaii, 260 million people were killed by their own government. 
So I do think you're right, but here's the $64 million question. With shows like this and shows like mine and shows like Sheila, how many people are we reaching? Are we reaching enough to really cut into that 65% figure? Interesting question. Uh, I, I, perhaps the more, the, the bigger question is, even maybe reaching a large percentage of the population, and, and, and we are, uh, I can tell you that just by the numbers, but or, is, is it enough to persuade or, or assist people into doing what's right as opposed to doing what's easy or less um, you know, fighting is never easy. Resisting is not easy. It's a lot easier, especially if you're hungry. By the way, to turn in your neighbor who's there you got, go. you know, okay, so there you go. yeah, you got it. Wow, hmm. you got so it right there. What happens when Dave, Dave, Dave you tried, like Dave, I want to. Sorry, Dave. Chief. I just want to tell the audience because I don't think most people know this. Last fall, you do you remember when the Russian media invited you on their news show. Because you were expressing serious concerns over these GRIDX, you know, the GRIDX drills and the, the gun confiscation, the martial law. Well, you know, you go to try to target a big media group, and look what happened to you. Tell the listeners what happened with that scenario, Dave. That's an interesting story. But let, let me just tie up what I was going to say to Doug here, because I think Doug made an excellent point. Doug, if you've got food and water in your belly, you're more likely to resist the taking of your gun. But if you're starving, your kids are starving, and all you've got to do to get food and water is to give up your gun, you're more likely to do it. And this is why I think we're seeing the globalists have such a concentration of power of grabbing our food and water, like with T. Boone Pickens and the like. Um, and, Sheila, to your point about the Russian media, yeah, on October 12th, uh, the Voice of Russia called me at home, it was about 9 o'clock my time in the evening, and they said, can you come on at 5 a.m. your time? And I said, sure. And I said, what do you want to talk about? We want to talk about your, uh, um, your articles you've written about your concerns about martial laws coming. And I said, I'd be happy to. So I, I emailed uh, the producer my uh, credentials, you know, which include you know, my uh, university background, uh, and how I teach research and statistics, so I know a little bit about how to gather data, and, and I know a little bit about human behavior with my degrees in sociology and advanced degrees in psychology, and they didn't mention any of that in the bio, none of it. I was just the host of the Common Sense Show, and I knew bingo right then, this is a setup. They were already minimizing my ability to have some perspective on human behavior and to be able to do research. And they tried to minimize my concerns about martial law. And I recognized I was Alex Jones in a Pierce Morgan CNN interview. And I did the one thing that I've never done before. I acted accordingly, and I bulldozed my way through that interview. And I cut that uh, Kate Zickel off repeatedly and made the interview into what I wanted it to be. And I said, here, all the documentation is here. Go to this article on this date. And I was just a storehouse of information for 10 minutes. And, boy, she, was she glad to get rid of me at the end of the interview. I was pretty upset when I hung up because I knew what their agenda was, but I felt that I had taken advantage of a less experienced talk show host. Well, that afternoon, they, they put up the, uh, the, the MP3 of the interview, and they called me an extremist. And I didn't say anything on there that could not be justified through fact-checking. And so I fired back, and I said, well, Pravda might be dead, but the voice of Russia has done a wonderful job taking their place. And then one of their transcriptionists wrote to me and said, well, we are state-owned media, but we don't propagandize all the time. That's a quote. I almost fell out of my <laughs> chair laughing when I read this. Mm. And this started an exchange between us, and this is all on my website in the comments section. Uh, essentially, here's what they were doing. I never mentioned then the Russians were going to be involved in martial law, but they are. And what the Russians were trying to accomplish by discrediting me was to achieve two degrees of separation. One, there is no martial law that's coming. You're just an extreme crackpot. And two, if there's no martial law, Russians can't get implicated. That was the purpose for them discrediting me, Sheila. That's why they invited me on. Well, and make no mistake about it, like you said, Dave, VOR is a propaganda instrument of the Russian government, and their handling of that interview was absolutely disgusting, in my opinion. Well, you were probably a little shocked about how I bulldozed my way through, because when I'm invited on a show... I so respect these talk show hosts, all of you guys, the shows I go on. If I don't respect someone, I won't go on their show. And 
I would never try to behave rudely, even if I disagreed. Um, and in that interview, I won't say I was rude, but I was certainly overbearing. And that's because I was determined to get my message out. This show went to Washington, D.C. and New York City and 35 other countries. And I was not about to let myself squander that opportunity to tell the truth. <laughs> well, I definitely think the producer got a, the shock of her life when you you made Alex Jones off the Pierce Morgan show look like child's play really <laughs> <today. laughs> Um, I had my Alex Jones moment, yes. And I thought he performed admirably with Pierce Morgan, who I cannot stand. I'm so glad they showed him the door, and Alex was masterful in what he did. Well, if you're an extremist, I guess that goes for Doug, I, and Joe, too. So, you know, but here's the thing, you know, where the heck are the other, uh, where the heck are the FEMA DHS drills? Where are they being talked about for that whole six to eight week? period where there was foreign troops playing a prominent role in those grid X takedown drills, etc. I mean, there's things going on right now that I have to just almost give myself a face palm because I don't even know how you, you know, it's a nine-week training course for UN peacekeepers to learn urban warfare and U.S. systems. English, English you know, don't forget English. Oh, don't forget English. <laughs> that means there's foreign troops, oh, you know, those Russians and Chinese troops that don't exist in our country. Well, someone's being taught English. <sighs> well, that, that's think... just so we don't have to uh, uh, press one for English or two, you know, one for English uh, uh, when we call the FEMA camps. <laughs> yeah, oh, really. Uh, well, press, you've got about uh, we've we've got about six, seven, eight minutes left in the show. I think uh, you know, just take it away. Sheila, Dave, can I say one thing? To... I mean, I wanted to go back and kind of tie up a loose end on Monica Weslowski, and I promise Absolutely. I'll just take a second. But um, we, we, we went into a, a break and we changed gears. And I want to say this to everyone out there. If your child falls down on the playground and you take your kid to get a stitch and someone decides to call CPS, your kid is gone. I'm telling you, this is the way the system's set up. They incentivize stealing. And what I'm trying to do with Monica's case, it's not that I'm so in love with her case. and I, I am. I'm committed to it emotionally. But it's not that it, it's just this one case that I'm dedicated to. I think this could be the big case that we show the rest of the CPSs around the country. Hey, this can happen to you. See, people are going to lose jobs. When Monica gets this in the court, the people who violated her confidentiality and the psyche vow and broke all kinds of ethical and legal procedures, they're going to lose their jobs. When they're trying to influence psychological diagnosis improperly behind the scenes and there's a paper trail, they're going to lose their licenses to practice. And I'm hoping by making Monica such a big uh, case across the country that the rest of the CPS agents are saying, hey, I know what happened in Virginia. I'm not going to go there. People are going to lose their jobs, and I'm also going to go after the county attorney in Fairfax County, Virginia, who's not enforcing the Constitution. His people need to unelect him because of his subordinate, M. Chris Sigler, who's violated so many of Monica's rights. So we really need help in this. We've got to raise about seven to 8000 more dollars, and I would ask everyone to go to our website, at thecommonsenseshow.com. It's the first article up there. Scroll down, and you'll see the two ways you can donate. And no amount is too small. One dollar, five dollar, ten dollars. We had a gentleman today, uh, Mr. Moon, who who donated five thousand dollars. But no amount. And if you can't donate, say your prayers for Monica, because this poor lady and her son have been horribly abused by the system. Well, and Dave, for anybody saying it doesn't affect me, you better think again, because any conservative Christian or Hopefully they're not an NRA, NRA member by God, but this affects all of us. When somebody can swoop in and take your child for no reason, Dave, this is absolutely, everybody should be in an uproar about this case. It's absolutely disgusting. And Dave Hodges and I and Doug and Joe are just not going to sit idly by and just let these uh, de facto Fed agents run roughshod over this woman and her child. Not just Monica. I mean, about two weeks after I came out with my first article, I heard from a lady named uh, Catherine Marion, and she lives up there by Yushu in, in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, and her son was taken and given to two uh, homosexual fathers. And I heard from a lady in London, England, same exact thing. Heard from another lady in Holland, same thing. This is not just a United States issue with stealing kids for profit. This is an international phenomenon with all the Western democracies. 
But Dave, in London, England now, the the basically de facto CPS people can actually rig cameras in your homes now. They're just literally saying, well, if you have any issue with your children, they monitor you 24-7. And this has actually been proposed by the CPS in, in various states, that now they can bring in cameras, monitor everything you do down from what you feed your children. If you've got guns in the home, look out. I mean, it is just absolutely, ugh. This oh, no, you're so absolutely hard. right. But, you know, this is why organizations like Vocal, and you can Google them, V-O-C-A-L, they're at the forefront of trying to call attention to stuff like this. And there are some parents' rights organizations like Vocal that are doing a wonderful job, but I would encourage people to to basically Google these and support these organizations because here, here's what's at work here. Here's the bottom line. It's not just about helping Monica get reunited with Dylan. That's big, or stopping these other abuses. But this is a deliberate attempt on the part of the globalists to undermine the family. You take a Catholic boy and give him to two male homosexuals. I don't care what people do behind closed doors with their bodies. That's between them and God and themselves. But I do care when it becomes a matter of policy to uproot a family structure. And this is about the destruction of the family unit in this country, and this is exactly what the globalists are after. If you want to take down a country and its culture, destroy its family. And that's what's behind all these CPS abuses. Absolutely. Very. Wow. Yeah. yeah D- Dave, uh, b- plug your show. We're we're at the. Uh, let me see here. We're we're just in the waiting uh, waiting moments of the of the end of toward the end of the program. We've got about uh, three minutes left. P- plug your show. Plug your website for new listeners who don't know you, which is, I find hard to believe. But go ahead. Well, all right. It's okay if you don't know me. Sometimes I don't know myself when I hear the words coming out of my mouth. Um, my show airs from 9 p.m. to midnight at Central Time, and uh, you can get to my show a number of ways. We're on some stations. Uh, too long to give the list, uh, but you can go to my website at thecommonsenseshow.com, and it says Listen to Dave, so you can listen to me there, or you can go to republicbroadcasting.org, and you can also click their Listen Live button. So those are the ways you can listen, and we have uh, terrific guests on. Uh, I've had uh, uh, two of the three people I'm talking to now, Doug and Sheila, on my show. Joe will have to work on you as well. Uh, so we have great guests on the show, and we do a lot of the same kinds of things that uh, Doug and Sheila and Joe are trying to do, which is try to make sense out of a crazy world and retain as much of our rights as possible. Absolutely, Mr. Hodges, uh, anytime. And it's uh, always a pleasure having you on, and God bless you and all the hard work you do, the great writing. Uh, please keep it up. We need to... We need to have that information. And thanks for being part of our inaugural show on the weekend edition with the Weekend Vigilante and uh, the Hagman Hagman Report. Thank you so much for being a guest. I'm always honored to be on with the Hagmans, and Sheila, it was my distinct honor to be on you with you on this uh, maiden voyage. Thank you, Dave. And also just tell our listeners who you have on tomorrow night, Dave. Plug your, plug your guest. I have on a, a, a guest, uh, Susan Knowles who is a former attorney, current psychotherapist. She uh, was involved in helping get Justina Peltier returned from CPS to her parents. Uh, We're also going to look at Agenda 21 issues. Uh, So uh, she's extremely knowledgeable. I mean, she is a researcher's researcher, and the listening audience is going to be enthralled with her just like I am. Excellent. Fantastic. God bless you, my friend. Sheila, go ahead and close us out. Well, what a, a gambit and plethora of topics we ran through tonight. Um, you know, went from the UN to the who's who of the globalists to Peter Sutherland to the CPS child sex trafficking right up to the Queen, and then we jumped right back into gun confiscation in the UN again. So we really kind of connected some dots there, and I think it was a very uh, kind of hallmark show of what people can expect. You know, we are going to have amazing guests every Saturday, um, as well as get into, of course, the uh, the headlines. As you always say, the headlines and the bylines, right, Doug? I mean, we're definitely going to be, um, it's going to be a hard-hitting show, and I really want to encourage everyone every Saturday to uh, to be listening in, because we're going to be really bringing the heat, Doug. And folks, uh, I would encourage everyone who found Sheila to be a blessing. I certainly have to... Uh, Help help keep her us well her in particular on the air. Um, go to go to weekendvigilante dot com weekendvigilante dot com. Make sure you spell it correctly, not like I did once or twice on the uh, on the promotion. And uh, yeah, just uh, pay a visit. And if you can, just 
uh, support her efforts to keep her uh, researching and also broadcasting. We just uh, we love you, Sheila. We really do. And when this um, this debut of the weekend edition it was fantastic. I want to say thank you. Well, thank you, Doug. And and I just want to say a final note. I got inundated with emails, and everybody said, "Oh, good." The investigator of the airwaves teams up with the instigator of the airwaves. So I thought that was kind of cute. <laughs> well, <laughs> so God, it's going to be powerful. You. Thank Indeed you very much, be. Doug. Thank you, and thank I want you. to thank all the listeners for tuning in tonight. God bless. God bless.